Education Committee. We are deliberating on vote five at the Western Cape Provincial. My name is Deirdre Bart. Um, colleagues, if you don't know me and the way I am, that you will know soon. Members online, you all attend Budget Committee, I assume. So I'm going to allow online members to first introduce themselves. Then I'm going to allow the minister and the delegation. The minister and HOD will have opportunity to make introductory remarks, and we will jump straight into the deliberations on vote five, which is on pages 165 until 193. I will take the pages 10 pages at a time since there is 48 pages and we only have four hours. This includes the respective annexures. If you are referring to the infrastructure documentation, um, I have checked the infrastructure book. The infrastructure documentation is the exact same as in the budget book as well. But you're welcome to refer to the infrastructure pages. And I just ask that we please refer specifically to the page that you're asking the question on to make it easier for our colleagues. But with that, members, please introduce yourselves. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Department Phil and Christians. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Khalid Sayed, and good morning also to the um, leadership of the department. Good morning, Chairperson Khalil Barankesh, and good morning to the department also. Good morning, Chair and the department, Ms. Sulikama. Thank you so much. Those are the, all the members I see in the house. If the members online can introduce themselves, please. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Minister, the department, and member colleagues. Wendy Kaiser Philander. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning. Chair, Chair Andrikas van der Westen, an alternate member and an observer today. Welcome. Good morning, Chairperson Regan Allen, and good morning to the Minister as well as the Department. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other members online. Minister, welcome. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Good morning to you and to all our colleagues. Thank you so much. HOD, if you would like to introduce your delegation. Thank you very much, Chairperson. My name is uh, Brent Walters, HOD for the Western Cape Education Department. I'm just going to ask my colleagues to go down the line and introduce themselves. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson. Leon Eli, uh, CFO for Education. Thank you. Good morning all, Sally Abrams, Deputy Director General Education Planning, WCD. Good morning everyone, Harun Mohammed, Deputy Director General Curriculum and Assessment Management. Alan Mayer, Acting Deputy Director General, Branch IDC. Brona Hammond, Director Communication. Morning Chairperson, Matthijs Kronier, Chief Director, People Management Practices. Good morning Chair, Warda Conrad, Director, Business Strategy and Stakeholder Management. Good morning, Chair. Last but not the least, I'm Marianne Eisen. I'm the Director for Management and Counting. Good morning to you all. Thanks. Thank you so much. Is there anyone of the delegation online? OK, and our, our, our colleague at the back, a friend of the committee, if you can introduce yourself, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nolufet. I'm just a community member from Atlantis. No problem. Thank you for attending. There will be an opportunity should you wish to make any Colleagues, with that, Minister, um, I'm going to allow now for introductory remarks, if you have any, as well as for the HOD. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and again, good day to colleagues on both sides of the house and, of course, to my team. Um, firstly, let me welcome you, Chairperson, in your new role. I hope you will find it as challenging as we do. I'm sure you will enjoy being with education. Um, for the first time in many, many years, we actually, uh, as education, are getting a helping hand in terms of this budget allocation. And um, I think the pressures in our department are well known um, and well documented. And for us to re receive an additional allocation for the upcoming financial year of 2.213 billion rand is certainly going to assist in alleviating some of these pressures. Um, 
obviously I must impress on the committee that we don't spend that amount kind of money overnight, that there is planning that has to be done. Uh, but we have already started doing that planning and uh, it's uh, it's really well underway. So we are completely committed to ensuring that we use every cent of that money to the maximum. Um, of course, the 2.5 billion rand in infrastructure is also a huge, uh, a huge thing for us. We are well aware that our schools need to be uh, first of all, we need new schools, new classrooms. We need to maintain existing schools. So that is very, very welcome for us. Of course, spending that kind of money is is a challenge. But as Mr. Abrams said the other day, this is a nice problem to have. And uh, we have already started. I know he's done a lot of work with his team to ensure that we have and are putting measures in place to uh, ensure that we spend that money. But I have to say, uh, Minister Mania in his speech did refer to the fact that PTI 16B is going to be re uh, removed, uh, revoked. And I really must emphasize that if that does not happen very soon, it's going to have an impact on our ability to spend that money. And we'll be sitting here again at the end of the next year with the under expenditure. So um, we really just want to highlight that the importance of the, um, that uh, provincial treasury instruction being uh, re removed. The one risk I do also just want to pick out of the uh, the budget um, document is that in the outer two years, the WCED has not provided for any cost of living adjustments, which is obviously an ongoing issue. Um, and of course, we also are taking over ECD from the 1st of April this year. Um, it's going well. We've had good engagements with the Department of Social Development. And in fact, the Western Cape model is going to be used across the country um, of, of how they deal with the, uh, the NGOs in the ECD sector. We've had good engagements with the, the sector and have um, undertaken to continue the existing um, setup as it currently is. It's working well uh, as we get to know it and understand it and have further engagements with them to see how we can then make improvements uh, over time to streamline it and really maximize the impact of having ECD under the education umbrella. So. Overall, I think um, we are really very happy this year. We're extremely grateful that our plight has been taken notice of. And uh, yes, I'm happy to hand over to my HRD and, and then to the committee for questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, HRD. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and uh, warm welcome to you in the new role. Uh, and good morning to all the members. Uh, thank you for having us here this morning the management team to speak with you this morning. Thank you very much for that. I think maybe just to add to what the minister has said, my uh, reflection from my side is just to say that I think what we see in the system is, um, as minister said, it's a nice problem to have. The Treasury has responded to the issue of the growth inside the system that we are experiencing inside the schools. We've seen unprecedented growth in the system uh, just to give us a metric of of sort of what are we dealing with? Because I think sometimes when you sit back, you need to look at that. 1.12 million learners in the system, uh, 43,000 teachers, sorry, 43,000 staff, of which 40,000 are at the schools, 1,519 schools, uh, all different modalities, 19,000 teacher assistants, and a growing population of learners year on year. And obviously the system has to respond um, in relation to that. And I think what we're presenting here today, Chairperson, is a uh, attempt to show that there is actually a response uh, to that. I think the other thing that must be taken into account as we go into the into this budget year is that the uh, education sector suffered quite badly over the last two years. Uh, that is 2021 and 2020 in relation to COVID-19. And in our uh, estimation, we think we were correct because we pointed this out last year already. Uh, in our estimation, what we saw there is that we were thinking that younger age groups would take the losses that have been experienced in learning a lot greater than older age groups. And that is because older children can actually work on their own. They can follow instruction independently. And generally, uh, you know that we want rotational learning. So that meant that they had to do things on their own. And they did that better with the older age groups. And we see that. We see that in the systemic results. We see that in the national senior certificate results. But you also just see it from what teachers are telling us and what's happening on the ground. So we've returned full time uh, in February, as you, of course you know. Um, that's, that's not without its issues, Chairperson. Uh, the sector got used to having two years of rotation. 
So it's an adjustment for our teachers, our educators. It's an adjustment for our students to be able to cope with that. And we believe that uh, some of what are we responding just in terms of uh, this process is to respond to the needs of our teachers. So having said that, our policy priorities in the strategic plan remain the same. We obviously want to expand uh, quality education through expanding learning, enhancing performance, strengthening uh, functionality and accountability, strengthening innovation. But I think because of COVID-19, we, we as a management team have said, person I'm being interrupted now by a phone. <laughs> so, person, so so we as a we as a management team sort to talk about so you know besides this quality education stuff that we just do need to do, what are the other things that we think should be focused on for the year going forward? But we decided uh, that we need to take the education system back to basics. And we, we say back to basics, back to the flow, back to the future. Uh, that's how we're seeing it. And the three three areas that um, we are focused on for what we focus on for this year and maybe even the following year, depending on how it goes. First is foundation phase, uh, reading, writing, and calculating. The next is blended learning and uh, digital learning, or that we will skew towards the older age groups um, for in the beginning. And then the third thing is really important for us. That would be the well-being and psychosocial support to the sector. It's our educators and our learners. Um, because I think we know that uh, they are in a confined space every day, Chippers, in a classroom full of people for the day. Um, you know, we work in offices, we move around, we change our systems. It's about providing that necessary support, I do believe, um, to our educators. So I think we'll see that. And then the minister has, I think, adequately covered the idea that the extra funding clearly will go into infrastructure to make sure that we can provide the classrooms that need to be provided, that we can provide the teachers, that we can provide the learner support material, that we can provide the extra transport routes uh, if those come up. Uh, also that we can increase the number of no-fee schools that there are inside the province. And then the minister ended off, and I want to say, agree with the minister, we have ECD coming. Um, it's 400 odd million rand in the budget. It's about 400 million rand in the budget. Uh, we're taking over a whole section from another department. I think having been through a few changes like that in my career, that's not without its difficulties, Chairperson. And what we've committed to there is uh, we had a meeting, as Minister indicated, was led by the Premier and the two MECs. We had a meeting with the sector where we indicated that we will keep everything the same for two years while we understand what it is. If we do want to change anything, what it is we're actually changing. Um, so having said that, Chairperson, we're very pleased to present this budget uh, and this uh, this process to you. Uh, the significant increases for us. So thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you so much. Before I let us jump into the book, um, I'm aware that there are some people from the public also. Okay, going once. Member Philandra, your hand is up. Yes, Chairperson. Um, I'm not sure whether it's only on my side, but there's some stages that um, you do not come through on the online platform. So okay. if ICT can perhaps just check. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Thank you so much. Our procedural officer will assist me with that. Um, is there anyone um, on the online platform from the public that just want to introduce themselves? Okay, if uh, I see one hand. Member van der Westhuizen, you can quickly go ahead. Introduce myself, but just to confirm uh, what uh, colleague Philandra said, and uh, I've actually sent you a WhatsApp to, uh, to to suggest that you perhaps use the microphone next to you, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. I don't always check my WhatsApp since I am chairing. There's another hand quickly, VR. Um, good day, Chair. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm Vanessa LaRue. I'm from the organization called Parents for Equal Education South Africa. Thank you so much. Anyone else from the public? Member Christians, I saw your hand. Chair, thank you. Uh, just uh, a question um, with the opening remarks. Can we just ask one or two questions when it comes to the opening remarks, what the HUD and the Minister said? Uh, 
When I open up the first 10 pages, you're welcome to ask on the opening remarks. I do, however, note that the focus that the HOD spoke of is on page 166 underneath the three bullet points, and the increases for the no-fee schools is on 167 also on the page. So you're welcome to ask on those when I open for the first 10 pages. Alex, what I'm going to do is I don't see any other hands. Ms. Ms. Leroux? Yes, Chair. Oh, your hand is still up, so I wasn't sure yeah, if you... Sorry. sorry, I've just lowered now. No problem, thank you so much. I will open up for the public submissions at the end as well. Okay, colleagues, with that, we're going to jump straight into pages... The other hands for pages 174. 174, I see Member Karmazan, I see Member Sai, and... I don't see any online, so I'll go with those three first. I'm going to give you two questions each because I realize we are about seven members in the house today so that we can allow for as many as possible members to ask questions. Member Krishan? Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, to the Minister and HOD. Just uh, my two questions would be on, you know, um, we st there, there's a big problem, and, and I'm so glad that the HOD pointed out the back to basics, the foundation phase, digital learning, and also the psychosocial support. There's a, there's a big need for psychosocial support. And um, th that, uh, that for me, I just maybe just want to know, you know, um, because we go to districts and there's always a need and you go to, I've been to quite a, a number of schools uh, uh, and psychosocial support is always a big problem. How, how are you going to enhance that uh, uh, psychosocial support to, to, to extend it maybe uh, more? Because uh, I, I know it's a, it's a big need. The, the big problem that we had and we saw on our oversight visits and also uh, in and out is the class ratios is now ridiculous. Um, I, I went to schools where the 63, 65, and, um, you know, um, I know we have, and I don't know how long we're going to have the teach teacher assistance. So that, of course, comes from NASA, and that's a big help. But even to deal with, you know, our class ratio. So some, and 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 uh, so so I know the last meeting that we had, we spoke about um, maybe I have temporary classrooms, and so, just to, to reduce the numbers. I'm I'm very worried that some of the learners are left behind because of the big numbers, um, and and that is a a, a big concern. Uh, so HOD, if you can help me to say how, you know, we know we have the numbers on ratios uh, when it comes to certain grades, but I'm I'm extremely concerned because this quality education that we want to go, uh, give to our learners is it really qualification if we have so much learners? I think that's my two chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Member Kama. No, thank you very much, uh, Chair. And let me also welcome the the opening remarks from the the Minister and the HOD. Chair, my 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 question um, is is premised based. Uh, I think firstly there is a there is a there is a there is a report you know there is a world uh, bank report that recently showed that South Africa um, is the most unequal country in the world and it further showed that um, the inequalities in education were one of the drivers of these uh, inequalities and with that in mind then chair I want to zoom to 169 where we talk about um, the where the bullet talks about uh, we talk about the review of the current financial year, specifically on the live streaming of lessons and online learning, <clears throat> uh, which gained traction. Now I want to understand with with that uh, report in mind, uh, how is the department uh, planning to address the wide inequalities, uh, which were obviously exposed by the live uh, streaming lessons during hard lockdown, uh, which one can can say that uh, mostly benefited those who really have access to the actual online platform. 
and 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 get a sense of that discussion as to how is the department planning to use education in the Western Cape to close the gap between the poor and affluent um, uh, schools. The other question that I have on page 170, Chair, uh, paragraph one, last sentence, where the department talks about the, the improvement in pass uh, metric, and I think one welcomes that uh, slight improvement. Uh, but one would like to get uh, more understanding about the focused programs to assist those schools with pass rate uh, below 50 percent and 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 how much is budgeted for that and perhaps if we can get a sense because i think there is a particular program in the department that focuses in, on such schools that are, are, are below your 50 percent but as to uh, uh, how are we doing with that if you compare in terms of the schools that would have uh, performed from the, your previous uh, 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 academic year to the, the, the results that we, 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 we had. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much. Maybe you must come to Langsburg and I'll show you one of the high schools where you can get more than a 20 percentage increase in a pass mark. Remember Khalid Zayed? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chair, I know the, the approach taken is that we're looking at the pages, that's fine. But input was made by the HOD and the MEC. i just like to possibly, just before getting into the meat of the budget issues, just one or two short questions just on what they said here, if I could, and then I'll get into so, so, so firstly, just with regards to the input, both of the MEC and the HOD, but more so for the HOD, I think this one. Um, is the HOD able to provide an assurance that the department has, um, has, has fully analyzed and can stand by all the tabled performance measures? Um, and so, so that they can actually apply the technical indicated descriptions um, that they put in place to get a clean audit, because we we noted the, the the issues around the 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 records of the audits over the past three years. We just wanted to get a sense as to what is the assurance that we can get there. Then, just a worrying matter, and it's it's something that we've been dealing with the Blukumbos High School, the killing, the recent killing of um, Voyo Duna, the the. Uh, is it a teacher? May his soul rest in peace. And I understand there's a police investigation, but that speaks to a, 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 a there's a deeper problem at that school, as we know, in terms of SGB fighting. Just wanted to know, is there a program in place on the part of the department to protect whistleblowers that are part and parcel of staff and that are part of the SGBs and, 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 and so that we also get to intervene before it reaches that point. Now, just to get into the actual pages, uh, page 168, uh, the uh, fourth bullet uh, above where it says um, budget decisions, draft admission policy for public ordinary schools. I want to um, I want to welcome this intervention because it's something we've been calling for uh, since 2019. But now my office has been inundated with many appeals for interventions from parents who have applied correctly and timelessly at certain schools, particularly former Model C schools. With the other ones, it's because of place. But here, where there is place, there's issues of, 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 of uh, and we, f and we find that admission policies are not necessarily uh, implemented consistently by quite a few schools. I therefore want to just get an understanding um, of this draft admissions policy and how will it address those concerns. And then also, is it moving towards a possible uniform admissions policy um, with, uh, for, for all public ordinary schools? or at least where there are certain common themes that are flowing through. Then on um, page uh, 169 as well, or, or the, the, the next page, the second last bullet point uh, regarding the support that was provided to schools to procure um, 
sanitizing requirements uh, and, that the, and, and that the department acted quite swiftly. Uh, I just wanted to know, given the findings by the SIU against the WCED PPE procurement, uh, what remedial action has been taken, uh, particularly against the officials that have been implicated, and how much of the 2022-2023 budget uh, will uh, benefit Masikame trading? Then, um, page 170, paragraph 2. And beside, I'm just going to stop you there quickly. You've okay. asked four questions so far. Um, I did say, too, at the start, I'm going to allow you more questions in the next round because there are more members. I see there are hands okay. online. I will have a next round of questions, and then we can do that because I have allowed four already. Okay, that's okay. fine. Thanks. Member Philander. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chairperson. Chairperson, I, I, I welcome the opening um, statement by the minister as well as the department. I'm taking you back to page 165 where the department expresses its uh, mission statement. Um, that to ensure that every child has quality learning opportunities. Now, Chairperson, um, the reality is that the Western Cape do experience an influx of learners um, to the province um, annually. Chairperson, I just need to get an understanding from the Minister or the HOD. Um, what is the plea to accommodate those learners in the Western Cape? Now, education is a hard-fought freedom. And um, no child should be left behind. Um, what is, is is the department and the minister um, confident that those that direct need and that reality that exists are being attended to when it comes to allocation um, for the Western Cape? And then, Chairperson, also um, I welcome the infrastructure um, additional um, funding as well. And um, Chairperson, the mission statement also speaks to a functional and an enabling environment um, in order to provide that quality education to our learners. Now, Chairperson, my, my question is that how, how does the department um, involve communities? We see across the board many a times that um, we've got this pot of money, but we can only do that much. And um, there's also an obligation on us as community to make sure that the, that infrastructure put there, um, it doesn't belong to the department uh, per se, but it belongs to the community. Um, we need to ensure there's safety for our children, safety for our educators and safety um, for our non-teaching staff as well. Um, how does the department intend to more involve communities and other sectors to make sure that that infrastructure that are put there um, are more uh, taken care of and maintained um, within um, the, the next financial year. Um, that is my questions for now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Philander. I... Whose hand this is quickly? Oh, no, it's the Member Philander's hand. Okay. Minister and HOD, I'm going to allow between the two of you to allocate the respective questions um, for answering, and then we'll take another round. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. If I may start. Um, let me start with uh, Honourable Christians. Yes, we do know there is a need for psychosocial support, and the department can certainly outline more steps as to what we are doing about it. Um, my HOD and I were just discussing it the other day, in fact, and he said that... Um, uh, he attended a meeting where they said South Africa has one of the worst mental health uh, rate, well, mental lack of good mental health in the world. And it is a huge concern, obviously, for us as education as well as a province as a whole, which is why we are um, focusing on well-being as one of our, our three areas in our recovery plan, uh, including mental well-being. Um, as far as class ratios are concerned, I agree, they are ridiculous, which is why we've been complaining for so long about money. We are now finally getting rewarded a little bit for our complaints, and I sincerely hope that in the coming year we will be able to reduce those, those ratios uh, somewhat by the additional allocation. Um, teacher assistance, yes, they are useful, but it's also a little bit problematic in the sense that it's not reliable. We don't know when money's coming and when it's not coming. 
Um, and it also doesn't add to our baseline. We would, you know, it, it would be easier for us to have that on our baseline where we could ensure that we had those on an ongoing basis because I do know that they are useful. Um, Honorable Karma, um, inequalities, we're doing a lot already. I, I agree with you that uh, as far as access to uh, broadband, Wi-Fi, all those things, uh, it is a problem as far as inequality is concerned. Uh, and it did expose itself a lot more during COVID. But the, the thing is also not only in the education sector. I mean, a lot of the problems of uh, people not being able to uh, access um, online learning was because they didn't have it at home. Um, and I don't think anyone can expect the education department to provide Wi-Fi in people's houses. So it's a far broader problem than just education, but obviously it does affect education too. But having said that, we, I mean, we have for the last number of years had a huge focus on, on reducing inequalities in education. And it's been shown um, in our matric results this year as well, by, um, for the first time, I think ever, our quintile three schools outperformed quintile four schools, which so it is showing also in our systemics over the last number of years, we've been showing a really pleasing um, reduction in the gap between the more resourced schools and, and those in poorer communities. But obviously, there is a long way to go still. We have, uh, most of our schools have broadband, but of course, it didn't help during COVID because they weren't at school. So that is an ongoing concern. As far as improvements in matric, I think it's more than just a slight improvement. I mean, the percentage is one thing, but when you look at the fact that we had 6,000 extra learners also last year, I think it's a huge improvement. And again, a really big well done to all our staff at our schools and in the head office and in the districts who put so much effort into achieving that. Um, as far as focus programs are concerned for matrix, I think I'll leave that to the HRD to allocate. Um, honorable size questions. Yes, the first one was for the HRD about the performance indicators. Blue Combos, yes. Um, obviously, the teacher was unfortunately killed outside the school, but it does appear to be related to an incident that happens in the school. I am concerned about a number of schools and uh, conflicts in governing bodies, which, which end up in situations like this. It is very concerning. Um, and I will also leave the HRD to, to discuss the whistleblowing um, policy. Um, Admission policy, we remain committed to governing bodies determining the admission policy as specified in the, in the Schools Act. There are um, mechanisms to appeal uh, and they are used by many people. So if they're appealing to your office, you're welcome to direct them to me as the appeal authority. I have quite a number of appeals for, uh, from people. The problem is that there are some schools where everyone wants to attend and it's just not possible and everyone who doesn't get in there then gets understandably upset but the point is we cannot have if schools get a thousand or more applications sometimes and there are about 280 places and when you look at the application of their policy it's it's not necessarily unfair it's just that people aren't happy because their child didn't get in and i understand that as a parent um it's not easy but it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem with the policy. And if there is a problem with the policy, there are people who have appealed to me and I have found one or two issues and they are, um, they have been uh, granted. So um, we'll have a look at the policy. Um, I don't think I've seen it yet, but HRD may wish to add to that, but we remain fundamentally committed to the principle that the HDBs have the right to choose their admission policy, as long as it's in line with the constitution and legislation. Um, as far as uh, SIU findings, I also will leave that largely to the, uh, the HOD. Safe to say it was hardly a problem with procurement overall. It was a tiny sliver of, of a problem with one of the procurement, uh, which was, uh, so it's not quite an accurate reflection, but yes, obviously there was a, an issue there and the HOD can address what he's done about it. Honorable Flander. Yes, we ha um, obviously are accommodating learners. We have to by law accommodate learners, but because of the fact we haven't had adequate funding and adequate resourcing, that is led to the issue that Honourable Christians has complained about, uh, which is the overcrowding. So I'll leave it to my HRD to say, are we confident um, regarding allocation? But we certainly doing the very best that we possibly can. Um, and infrastructure issues, how we intend to involve the community? That's a difficult question. Um, I, I do think that as education, we maybe haven't involved communities as much as we could have, but at the same time, we can't consult everybody on everything we do in, as a department. We have a huge, huge workload 
And sometimes people are, are not, uh, you know, everyone wants a school in their, in their town and they all want a school of skills and they all, you know, and we just simply can't do that. So there is a limit as to what we can do, but I do think we can improve somewhat on that. And I have discussed that also with the HD. Thank you, HD, if you can answer the rest. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, maybe just uh, add some answers that perhaps um, just to add to some, but also one or two of our team will perhaps just um, add, or if I can ask uh, Mr. Mayor, if you can maybe just talk a little bit about the Blue Combos situation, and then I can ask Mr. Cronier a little bit about the whistleblower policy. If you can perhaps just talk uh, on that. And then between Mr. Mohammed and uh, Mr. Abrams, uh, just the issue of the online, the online um, plan. In other words, the blended learning online plan. What will we be doing in relation in relation to that? But maybe I just want to start with uh, Member Kama's assertion when he said that education is a driver of inequality. Um, I think he was saying that we mustn't add to inequality. But the truth of the matter is that. If you go into any country in the world, education is a mirror image of the inequality in that society or the equality in the society. So we're on the receiving end of other factors that actually impact on what happens inside the school environment. Uh, and that is true of every country in the world. So I think our struggle as a department is to say, let's accept that South Africa is a very unequal society. Our education system mirrors that inequality. And what are the things we can actually put in place to try and mitigate? Um, I would like to use this example, Member Kama, that of pick and pay. You know, pick and pay roughly in the Western Cape, the size of the organization is similar to us. Uh, you know, they have a footprint, I think about 60,000 employees, and they got 2,000 stores. But they only have five types of stores hypermarket, uh, superstore, uh, whatever. And the modality for those five. It's the same. So you can roll it out anywhere and it's this kind of store. I think our difficulty is we have 1,519 different production units. They're completely different. So I think that's a challenge. It's top of mind uh, for the education department. I know, I know of my colleagues here, many of them have been in this game longer than I have. And, you know, we push to make sure that we can get that, uh, that, that um, equality. Just on the question, uh, so we come back to the questions. I will talk, and then if there's anything we left out, we will we'll, we'll double back on it. Um, just to talk about the underperforming schools um, and what is the plan for the underperforming schools. I think uh, what we, uh, and uh, uh, I think Member Kama, you're the, you're the one who asked about that. Maybe maybe just to say that you spoke about the pass rate below 50%, but we, and our plan that we have to uh, commit to is a pass rate below 60%. We regard them as underperformed below 60%. So we have a provincial plan prepared for submission to the uh, Department of Basic Education. Each school uh, prepares an academic performance improvement plan, and then the districts focus attention on these schools to try and see, um, you know, what it is they can do. But Mr. Mohammed uh, can also talk a little bit about. So that would be just overall. But Mr. Mohammed can also answer the question about what is what are, was uh, another member asked, what is the efforts in terms of making sure that this year the metrics are actually supported in the National Senior Certificate? There's winter schools and autumn schools. Mr. Mohammed can talk about that, all the, the issues that we uh, push in, in that regard. As far as the um, SAU report is concerned, maybe I just want to say the following uh, member said. Um, so there was an SAU report. As you, of course, know, uh, it names certain officials in the department. I did believe that there was a conflict of interest for me to uh, act on that in the sense that one of the officials was a direct reporting line and then referred that matter to the Department of the Premier, uh, the Labor Relations section of the Department of the Premier for advice on dealing with it. I have since received the reply. I'm applying the, my mind to the reply. And then I think we'll, we'll make a public uh, statement. We'll make a statement after that. Okay. So then just if I can also then just talk about um, the question about assurance that you asked. We can never give assurance because we don't know what the AG is going to do. Um, you know, you're asking us now for something that I don't think members said we can say yes with confidence. Love to be able to say yes with confidence. But I think what happens with the Auditor General is that each year there's an um, increasing measure of scrutiny. Uh, they work on an evolutionary system of auditing. 
So the higher you are last year, they go put you a little bit higher in the next year. So I can't actually guarantee that that would be the situation. However, what I can say is we are focused on uh, technical indicator descriptions, as you, you mentioned it inside your input. Uh, we've, we've looked at you know all the things that can be done um, to make sure that uh, in the end, we can move towards what you have termed the clean audit. But I think more importantly for us, it's just on the performance side to make sure that, you know, I don't know what advert it was, but it said the promise you make is a promise you keep. So just to make sure that we can do that, so just to give um, that assurance that we will be will be doing that. I think then there was a question also asked about psychosocial support and you know what is the what is the, the kind of efforts that we are engaging in. The minister really alluded to the fact that there's a study showing that mental well-being uh, in our country is amongst the worst in the world. Okay, there's anxiety and people feel uh, fractured uh, in relation to that. So there are a few things happening. We have a hotline for teachers and learners. We also have a change mindset program for teachers and a growth mindset program for learners. Uh, we, we provide psychological uh, support um, directly to schools when it is required, especially when they have incidents. And we also have outreach teams uh, that come from district offices in relation to that. But also, Chairperson, the health department has uh, pull, pulled a few departments together on a team dealing with mental health. They call it mental health. And we are, we are, we are part of that. There are a few, few departments on that to look at um, how we can obviously make sure that our teachers are um, well um, inside the sector. Um, and then maybe uh, the last comment from my side, uh, Member Philanda, but as minister did answer it about the communities and the difficulty we have, um, you know, we always try to improve. I, I do want to say the SGPs really represent the reflection of community. The one sector where you have a measure of control in communities' hands through SGB. Um, so, you know, that's that I don't think you find that in other sectors, Jefferson. Um, you know, so th that comes with great opportunity and obviously great challenges for us. So I think that's I'll answer as much as I can. And if there anything is that we haven't covered, I'm going to ask the rest of the team to perhaps just comment on one or two things. And the NJ person, if there still is nothing, it's something that we haven't covered, you can just point it out and we'll go back to it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you can go first. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, in, re in response to the Blukombos matter, um, we have lodged a formal investigation. Um, it is in its final stages. Um, I know there's been charges uh, that have been put to the principal, amongst others. Um, the SGB legitimacy of membership has been questioned and uh, the need to provide substantive evidence of a parent on the governing body actually legitimately being a parent of a learner at the school or a court-assigned um, caregiver of a child. All of that information has been requested. Uh, we found that the previous records were not necessarily a true reflection of the parents who were on the governing body. And so that's part of the ongoing investigation. We should have a decision um, around that, depending on the labor relations process, uh, fairly soon. Um, so the matter is in hand. The investigation is in the final stages of conclusion, and um, that matter is, is being dealt with. I want to add to what the HOD has indicated is the, you know, the situation in not only Blukombos, but in other parts of the province as well, where the vying for position on governing bodies have led to, you know, quite catastrophic events. For example, you're aware of the Grabau principal that was shot, and recently the chairperson, the ex-chairperson of that governing body and his child also being shot. And so that kind of instability within the communities, and, and so we always ask, you know, all stakeholders to, to assist us where possible, you know, to, to address the community kind of issues that is spilling over into a governing body um, and then causes the disruption at the school as well. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, yeah, just with regard to the whistleblower um, uh, policy, uh, I can provide assurance to the member that there is regular training as well as um, advocacy around this specific element, both to our managers as well as to staff, uh, that they know what the provisions are. There is protection of the whistleblower, so that confidentiality is there, whichever entity is investigating that specific um, uh, issue that was raised. And then there's also the provision for any recourse if there's victimization, which we didn't experience so far. 
uh, but the recourse is there and we are uh, will enact on that uh, if we find there's any basis for that. Thank you, Chairperson. I'll uh, address the question on the online and the, the blended learning context. I think there are two aspects to that. One is in the short term, we recognize that whilst we fit out the, the education system with more resources, uh, we think about the appropriateness of particularly the digital capacity and capability, being able to stream lessons or provide access to learning resources um, in an online way. Um, that, of course, has to go hand in hand with with the ongoing context and our readiness for schools to receive that kind of modality. We are thinking about um, immediate impact in areas where we think it will fit. Uh, we speak about our skills uncertainty and the skills development challenge uh, at the top end of our spectrum for the grades 10 to 12. Uh, that's an area where we want to blend digital learning with, um, with other modalities. The reality, of course, is that our uh, accommodation pressure and some of the environmental factors that were being discussed, like class sizes, of course, at the grade eight and nine level. And so we're constantly thinking about how best to not destabilize a system that's struggling to recover, given that we've just returned all learners back to class, but to do that in a way that teachers feel supported and empowered to be able to offer alternative options to learners. And so the digital online learning is being blended in that respect for high school learners. Um, there is an, a case to be made that our foundational literacy is the gaps that we'd have seen at the other side of the spectrum at the foundation phase, the early learning. Um, the research will show that there's mixed results with regards to bringing in digital capacity, but the reality is more and more learners are exposed to um, the digital context. And so it's it's not that we are not prescriptive, it's emphasis and prioritization at this stage. I think we have a, in the truest sense of blended learning, approach, we have uh, equally emphasized graded readers and other printed material and an alternative to digital for the foundation phase um, and going with that first and then we'll take a more measured approach with digital um, for for our foundation phase. So I'm speaking to the context of, you know, what's the education strategy or policy, if you, if you like. But of course, it's side by side by the uh, the previous questions answered around the inequality context in that access to digital resources in the home, in the community, at the school. Those are very clear considerations um, and we will uh, embrace the opportunity post COVID or through COVID as we should um, to accelerate bringing that digital modality into, into our service model. I'll ask my, uh, Mr. Mohammed if he wants to add, uh, add anything Chair, uh, to the content aspects if necessary, thanks. Thank you very much Chair. So um, in, in March, April of 2020, um, the message we got back from the system very quickly on the e-portal system that we had where the digital divide is quite strongly there. We mounted an MS Teams facility for every single teacher in the province. So at the moment, over the two-year period, we have done about four sessions of direct engagement, particularly with the NSC I'm talking about now, but also in the uh, in the general education training band, but in the NSC. Um, in the course of last year, we did two rounds covering 10,000 teachers in the FET band. The first round for this year was a discussion on last year's results. So in other words, we've met with every single teacher in grade 12 to discuss last year's performance and the plans for this year. So just on the, on the digital divide, you know, the department has taken steps to, to make sure that we can reach um, all of the teachers. We also identified through... Um, a consultation with our districts that there were there are about a thousand one hundred schools that indicated that they needed a top up allocation for printing, and so over the two years and we'll continue into this year, the school those schools will receive a top up allocation for printing material, which learners cannot access or teachers cannot access digitally. Um, and then just on the um, e-portal, maybe just to mention that over the two-year period, the traffic on that system quadrupled and we're busy upgrading that, that process as well. Um, we also meet regularly with uh, stakeholders and we get very direct information on schools that are having difficulty with the infrastructure that we've put in place. So we're addressing those issues as, as they come along. On the uh, NSC program, uh, there were a couple of questions that were asked. So. Um, over the course of last year, we were, you know, at, at 
at this point last year, we were very doubtful about how we were going to actually perform, uh, taking into account all the factors. And at the moment, the system is quite buoyed up by the fact that we were able to post improvements. So we've said to the system, continue all of those things that we did last year. And I'll just mention a few of them. So in each subject, there is a subject, subject package that has been developed, which provides, as I mentioned, the analysis of last year's performance and previous trends, as well as um, the steps to be taken for this year. We've got a very lively telematics program, which is zero rated. Uh, our best educators in the province uh, have packaged very good uh, subject specific materials that are available on a daily basis to uh, to learners. And we've also got a very strong revision package to address the issue of uh, uh, learning losses that were accumulated over the last two years because of the rotational timetabling. Thanks, Chair. OK, based on my notes, everything has been answered plus extra. So thank you for the extra. Colleagues, I'm going to now allow for follow up questions on these pages. It is pages 165 until 174. If there are none, I will ask my questions. And then member Khalid Sai can go after. I don't know why I keep saying your first name. You're, you can go after me at the end because you've asked for questions. Uh, member Brunkes and member Karma can go before me. OK, in that order. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Jay. Uh, on page 173, um, provincial priorities, the WCED remains committed. Uh, page 173, provincial provin under the bullet provincial priorities. The WCED remains committed to supporting the WCG priorities of jobs, safety and well-being. Chair, I want to uh, let's on to the issue of uh, dropout learners uh, in, in the province. Um, I think they can also be uh, easily called uh, a, a pandemic, you know, in South Africa. Uh, that is now with, uh, with regard to primary and high school uh, dropout learners. When we when we drive around in the community, we see more and more youngsters sitting on the streets. They're supposed to be in school. Youngsters of the, uh, below the, the age of 10 uh, carrying uh, firearms and is in, indulging in gangsterism and, 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 and substance abuse. Is there, is there any initiative from the from the department to tackle this this problem of dropout learners in finding themselves on the streets um, to to rehabilitize them and to, to to see that they can get as soon as possible back into school or some other form of program for them to rehabilitate them. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Kama. No, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Chair. Let me appreciate the responses that have been given so far. Uh, Chair, my, my one, and I'm not going to uh, really HOD uh, waste time on this. Uh, I agree with, with what you are saying, that education can be a mirror of your inequalities. But I hope that we're not presenting a, a hopeless uh, a situation on the part of the department, because that would mean that uh, even the vision that is in this document is just there in the document. Because you have a vision to provide quality education to each and every learner in every classroom in the province. So, so it is on those basis that I'm asking the question, because the very same education can be a tool which we use to liberate even a nation from these uh, social ills that we're talking about. And and for example, Chair, uh, I, I, I saw during a lockdown in the higher education space, students were receiving uh, data. I think they were getting about 20 gigs of data uh, because they were at home. And the Department of Higher Education was, 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 was funding this initiative. So, so I'm asking now in terms of the department, 
and in this budget possibly, uh, what are we going to do to address the issue of accessibility to online by the different learners? Because the challenges of accessibility that are not only at home, as the minister wants to suggest, they are also in other parts of the schools which are in your rural parts of the province where they do not have access to this learning. And, and we want to make sure that all learners in the province receive access to this blended uh, education that we're talking about. That's 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 the follow up uh, chair. But the, the question also that I, 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 I want to zoom in on on page 166, uh, I think there are figures that were given there on main services and core, func uh, core functions. Um, uh, in terms of, I think we have about 1,514 public schools. But what I want to focus on is the issue of uh, uh, the, un uh, the placement of learners. And if one looks at the numbers that we would have had in the previous years in terms of the challenge of unplacement of learners and this particular year, you would see that drastically the department is doing well in terms of placing uh, the learners compared to the numbers that were there. So one wants to understand as to what are the different strategies that we would have uh, employed now to ensure that we, we are there. And perhaps to the numbers that we have today in terms of unplaced learners also includes those learners who perhaps uh, 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 might have applied very late, uh, 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 you know. So I want to get that sense as to uh, how are we responding to this challenge. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Member Kalma. We did get an email from the department regarding unplaced learners and that it was at about 3.40 and I think half of them were late learners from 2022 and the other half was late learners from 2021. But if there's any extra information the department would like to assist Member Kalma with, I will allow that. Uh, Member Regan has his hand up. Member Regan Allen. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Um, I just wanted to latch on to uh, Member Kama as well regarding the streaming. Um, as per page 169, it's also covered in the APP, which gives more information, but I think it will be helpful um, if the DG is able to, to elaborate um, regarding the plan um, we, um, and to give us an understanding of the role of the districts. Um, um, in that as well, um, if I particularly think of an area like Mitchell's Plain, for example, um, would there be a specific plan for an area um, like Mitchell's Plain and um, that particular district to ensure that those streaming um, options are actually available? And then just secondly, um, Chairperson, um, I noted um, on 169 as well that, um, that the meals will be continued um, to be provided. I wanted to check from if the minister or the DG um, is able to confirm that that 451 million rand, um, just over 451 million rand budgeted from the NSNP um, is sufficient um, um, for the need from the NSNP, if that amount is actually sufficient um, in order to, to provide these nutritionist uh, meals for, for the entire year for those in need. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask my questions now and the member side will close us off on these pages. OK. Page 171, under procurement. First of all, I'm not sure if the uh, approved annual procurement uh, plan has been provided to the committee previously. It might have been before my time. But if between the department and the procedural officer, we can just please get that annual procurement plan. Um, in terms of school feeding systems, which uh, Member Allen spoke about. So one of the UN reports on sustainable food procurement specifically speaks about school feeding systems. And there was a big report about, upon school feeding specifically. Um, some of the chapters in this book spoke about how one can look at Brazil, how one can look at South Africa. But for what I found interesting within the procurement system for schools and how you get it from local agriculture people was specifically the fact that both Brazil and South Africa is not actually part of the general procurement agreement internationally. 
But for some reason, Brazil was following the, the steps that, that the model procurement laws wanted actually and was getting good results. And South Africa is not ratified that particular procurement is not really following it and not doing as well. But we saw in the Western Cape, for example, compared to other provinces during lockdown, that the school feeding system uh, worked well. So if you can just give me some indication of what are you doing within the procurement system um, in order to ensure the sustainability of these school nutrition uh, feeding schemes. And if, if, if you can just, if maybe the CFO can just unpack for me, how exactly does the procurement they work and what the factors are that you take into account when you do the respective procurement. Then on page 173, it speaks there under point eight that there's no provision for salary adjustments for the outer two years of the MTIF, except for the pay progression, housing allowance, and medical aid. I do know that there's currently uncertainty regarding the wage agreement across South Africa in the public service. If we can just get some indication on how the department is preparing for this, because it's clearly not in this budget book. So if the wage agreement comes and if there's a change in the wage agreement, the budgets for the two out years is going to have to change. And uh, I, I would be, be sad to see if we are to cut from other budgets in order to make space for that, given that COE is already about 20 billion rand out of the 28 billion rand that we give you guys. Then under... Um, Oh, a follow up on member Brunkeis' question regarding kids that are not in school. I wanted to find out who is the responsible department or body for kids that are receiving social grants that are of school going age, but are not in school. Because, and, and maybe this is also because I enjoy reading some of the written questions that different departments send to different members, but it seems as if education refers to social development and social development refers to education. So if I could just get some clarity, because surely if you're getting a social grant and you're a child, you're on a system somewhere and your birth date is there somewhere. And surely if your birth date is there and it's not on a school system somewhere, you know, then, then we know the person is not in the one system. So if I can just get some indication, who do I speak to regarding that? Um, and then finally, no, sorry, those are all my questions. Thank you so much. Minister, HOD, who wants to go first? Chair, do I'm happy I... to start. That's so on the side. Member side, <laughs> because usually, usually I do ask all of my questions last, but I must now punish member side for asking too many questions in round one. Member side. Thank you very much, Chair. But I must say that your your questions largely covered me. The really good questions. Uh, just uh, one, not necessarily a follow up question, but a follow up statement on the Grabo matters, the violence in Grabo. I've indicated, I think, informally two officials, but I want to, I think, just repeat that there's a commitment on my part to really meet on the issue of the Grabau matters and bring on board the Tiavata Sklop municipality leadership, as well as community leaders uh, around just ensuring that we have greater cohesion and we can ensure that some of those tensions that are affecting now the SGBs and creating violence around those schools can actually just be curbed. So I want to put that commitment and I look forward to hearing from the department so we can actually have a meeting and go there and go and meet there. That's just on, on, on um, just relating to that response. Um, page uh, 170. It's a follow up in a sense from um, member Christian's uh, question on the psychosocial support. I just wanted to know whether the department hasn't uh, started to engage with the Department of Social Development to ensure that possibly um, social work graduates who are currently unemployed that they've got access to can maybe be brought on board to assist with regards to the capacity needed in terms of social cycle support. Then, um, with regards to also um, page 170 on the issue of procurement, the central education management information system, possibly somehow linked, um, just uh, I want to commend the department for the initiative that has now been taken after calls we've made for shopping malls to have pop-up banners 
uh, where um, parents can actually go and be assisted um, with regards to registration and application for next year. And I understand as to why it's not been maybe moved into other areas as yet, but I just wanted to get a sense as the department probably also looked at utilizing other public institutions such as libraries, um, halls also, maybe just to also deploy some staff there to assist as well with this. And I mean, we can also ensure that we speak to members of the public, um, various public reps to also rope in, in that regard. Then um, also on page 170, I just want to get an update regarding the commitments made by the Premier in SOPA for six new schools and 1,100 teachers. Um, how much of this budget that's being tabled will go towards these commitments? And how much will be spent on mobile classrooms? Then, okay, just in terms of learner transport, um, the uh, tensions in Kailicha, I understand. I just want to know, have there been further meetings uh, that have happened um, with the taxi operators. Then also, I also understand this tension in Kruakral, near Oudsworen, the UCC primary, also, around, uh, um, also with regards to learner transport. Can we just get um, some feedback in that regard? Uh, my final one, uh, Chair, uh, page 174. Um, uh, just in terms of the, uh, the, the there's a table, the 8.1 infrastructure development, uh, the 48.12% increase for infrastructure development is welcome. I think it's good. But I just wanted to get a sense as to how much of this budget will be used to address uh, 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 structures, the, you know, some of these old schools that were built way back in the 70s, asbestos schools. And I think in the last meeting that we sat, I think it was February or January, I provided a list of some of these schools and uh, um, and Wasima also formally submitted that list. I just wanted to know um, how much of that budget is also the department aware as to how many asbestos schools we have in the province. Uh, thank you very much. The rest will come in the other pages. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to punish you for extra questions within the next round of the other pages. I don't have a lot of <laughs> questions. Some of in the your next. infrastructure questions are already answered also on pages 210 until 213, where the list of what the infrastructure is going to is being done. But I do um, accept the question regarding asbestos specifically for the department to assist you with as well. OK, Minister. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you for the questions. I'm going to leave most of these to the department, but there's just one or two that I wish to pick up. The one was on uh, Member Allen about do we think the NSNP is sufficient? No, I don't think so in, in comparison to the need that we have. I also remain concerned about that the quintile system is still used largely to allocate money for the NSMP, and we are confined to a specific percentage uh, of the schools that are supposed to be in quintile one, two, three. There are some of our other schools that are included, but not uh, not nearly as many as I believe should be. Um, and we have other provinces that are not complying with their uh, allocations percentage of, of schools in, the, in those quintiles, and, and they are, are receiving funding. I believe for this for the NSNP, and I think we're being shortchanged on that score. Uh, I also want to address the issue of Honourable Bodman, the issue about the uh, who's responsible for for children not in school. We are responsible if somebody is registered at a school and is not attending at that school. We have uh, truancy officers that are supposed to uh, deal with those uh, learners. Um, if they are not registered at all at a school, then it is social development because obviously we do not have um, their details. So that's how it is. Um, it's not always ideal. Um, and obviously with uh, Poppy and so on, it's difficult to share information about personal details of, of people. Um, 
as far, and then the last question I just wanted to talk about is Kurt Kral. Kurt Kral, the tensions there are being caused by the former principal, whose now wife is acting in the in the principal position and is seemingly trying to circumvent this, the learner transport scheme that the department is putting in place so that he can transport them himself. This has been a long-standing complaint at the school, uh, and uh, I know that the department is dealing with that at the moment. So those are the ones I would like to take, and if I can ask the HOD to please address the others. Thank you, Chickers. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Chairperson. Thank you for the questions. Um, maybe just to start off, perhaps, um, so the colleagues will add uh, to some of the questions, but maybe just to start off with just in terms of the dropout. Uh, remember, Brown case, you asked about the dropouts, right? And I think you paint you paint a picture that is uh, that's a bad picture. Uh, youngsters on the streets and so on. But I think from our side, as the education department, um, we actually did a little bit of analysis on the dropouts. And we, we didn't actually find, we find a slight difference on dropouts when compared to normal years, right? The challenge that we have right now, the children that you see on the streets is, we have a high absentee rate, Chippers. Even though we've returned to school, we have high absentee rate. Um, so maybe that's what you, you, you're seeing, higher than normal. And we're attributing that to the fact that Learners have got used to rotation over two years. <laughs> and now we said be back at school every day. So that adjustment, so we're having discussions with our schools about how do we actually make sure we can get that adjustment. Remember at the end of this, it's also the obligation of the parent to see that their child is actually in the school. Um, we can do so much, I think, as a system. Uh, it's not to minimize the issue. I'm just trying to contextualize it uh, for you to say that we actually haven't seen Massive dropouts on the numbers. Mr. Abraham says a stat, so you can talk a little bit about the various dipsticks we take to be able to come to such a conclusion. I think Mr. Abraham's uh, in a normal year, we saw 1.9% and it went slightly over 2% in the COVID year. So, you know, on the dropouts. So, generally, year on year. Um, so, maybe Mr. Abrams, when he gets an opportunity to speak in relation to the, but I do want to make the point that it is also about us speaking to the community structures that we know their own power your positional power as uh, members of parliament speak also directly to parents to make sure that parents actually make sure that the children actually go to school because um, at the moment we are noticing on our first reports that we received in attendance it seems to be higher than normal uh, absentee rate in the beginning we're attributing it to the adjustment so having said that the key issue from an education point of view pedagogically we need these children in school in order to have teaching and learning. Because one of the major points about education, it's, a, it's an obvious thing, but nobody says it, but I'm going to say it. Education requires consistency. You can't teach a child if there isn't consistency. This is why we pushed as a department to actually get children back to school. We've been pushing since we had the vaccination program last year in July, Jefferson. And uh, eventually, you know, we got all this, everybody on site to be able to do that. So we're not unhappy about that. It does come with, other issues. You mentioned overcrowding was mentioned here. Uh, what you also see part of the explanation of that is that schools in the rotational space took on more learners. And then suddenly now you put the two classes together and then they're bigger chapters. So now they have to deal with it. They, uh, I don't know if there was a feeling that we're never going to go back full time. Maybe there was, I don't know. But we are back full time. We have to deal with that. So I think just to just to say that Mr. Abrams can add uh, in relation to, to that. I think a question of Internet accessibility, which was raised by Member Karma, um, and the fact that all learners should receive access, clearly we want a progressive realization of that. You know, it's not an immediate realization. We wouldn't be able to say immediately, yes, this is actually going to happen. But if you look at our policy statements, you see in our intent is to go the route of digital blended online. We, we, we're saying that as a, as a department. So clearly the system will move to be able to make sure that that does happen. I mean, I, I am aware, for example, that we have given land to schools. Uh, we've got schools with smart classrooms uh, and we've got streaming and various pilots that are, that are in place to be able to make sure that we can actually launch our children, our young people, our learners, as the education department calls them, the learners, uh, into this digital transformation age. And at the same time, not have learning losses. I think that's that's important. I mean, I think the um, chairperson did 
mentioned about the placement of learners that, uh, you know, we did receive a report. You, uh, I think we just recently sent you yesterday or maybe the day before. I'm not certain. Uh, we sent you a, a report as to where we are in the numbers. But I think the difference with last year, perhaps the beginning of last year, and this is that they focused attention as the management, discussing this basically at every meeting. And people who work specifically also for Mr. Mayer and his section as chief director of districts, he had a large number of people basically full time on this, trying to make sure we can get the placement. I just want to say that the dilemma is about, Minister really raised it in the opening remarks. The dilemma is that parents choose schools of choice and everyone goes for the same schools. You know, and because we're given this element of choice, we let people, you know, decide. I think that that is what causes the issue. But as you have indicated, thank you for the comments. I think the team has to hear that and we will communicate that back. We're in a better position than what we were last year. We still got a little bit of a way to go and we determined to um, be able to do that chairperson. We are, uh, I think, wrapping up and making offers to parents uh, for the ones that in the report that we sent to you said they're not placed. We're going to make an offer to parents and it's up to the parent to decide. But we are emphasizing that for basic education for a child between the ages of, uh, maybe the number wrong, I think it's 6 and 15 or 7 and 15, they have to be in school. So I think just to just to maybe to uh, to indicate that point. Okay, so I think that up with those. And um, if somebody could just remember Alan's question on the streaming, uh, maybe between Mr. Mahmoud and Mr. Abrams again, just to perhaps answer that question. Mr. Eli, there were a number of questions about wage agreements and budgets, which I think your best place to answer um, in relation to that question. Um, and we also note member say it's a comment about tier about this cloth, so we just note that comment. And then I think just on the question about, um, you know, are we going to, there was a question about are we going to, thank you for the malls, you said, and it's a good idea, but are we going to roll it out in any other way? So we already have agreement for pop-ups in 55 schools. Okay, uh, obviously I don't have the list here, but that's, we got 55, we have agreed that they will, provide that service for us. So that's going to be closer to community as well, uh, directly closer to community. So there'll be, we'll have officials and we'll have a system to be able to do that. And we provide that information widely again, Chair, just like as we normally do, and we make sure that you get uh, copies for the committee on how that actually um, is going to roll out. Um, then I think I've covered, and I'm sorry, there was a couple of other things here. Uh, okay, learner transport, red cow, I think Mr. Abrams will cover that. Uh, that's the question. Okay. Between Mr. Eli and Mr. Abrams and Mr. Muhammad, uh, if there's anything I've left out, can you please cover? Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Eli, do you want to begin? Your questions? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson. You asked a question around the uh, procurement around uh, the NSNP program, the National Nutrition Program. Uh, as you know, the National the school nutrition program is something that uh, the funding of that is a conditional grant, which is uh, allocated to us by DBE. Um, so they are, you know, the, the overall custodians of this particular grant. Uh, to for for us, we follow a, a open procurement system uh, to procure the services. So it's uh, for the different regions. So we we. With that tender, we break up into particular regions in terms of our district in district regions, um, and that is a, a again is an open tender. So so we have bidders coming in um, at various prices, and we evaluate them according to uh, the bid requirements. Uh, obviously, one of those things is uh, one of the factors is the number of, of learners involved in this. I think the minister alluded to to the fact that um, it's it's. Uh, Based on poverty, so we have we serve quintiles one, two, and three, and then we have exceptions which we obtain agreement from DBE for quint for some learners in quintile four and schools and in five as well uh, because there are historic things there as well. So um, from so so our main issue here is is, is pricing, uh, and then how the reason why we do that is obviously for us to obtain value for money. So we can we can stretch the RAN, so we can serve learners as much as possible. Uh, this grant is um, uh, managed in terms of or regulated in terms of DORA, Division of Revenue Act, 
uh, and there is an also set menu by DBE as well. So you need to comply with particular content uh, or composition and content in terms of the menu. So that we also have to comply with as well. We've been running this program now for quite a while now. Um, yeah, and successfully so, uh, so far, uh, because our, our service providers we do get, we do go through the diligence process with them in terms of the sustainability and whether they've uh, rendered a particular service like this before. So we do make sure that, um, you know, that the service providers we use is reliable. Um, and I'm going to talk about other provinces uh, because there are different mod modalities. But just again, in the Western Cape, we have a, a, a an open procurement system that complies with Section 217 of the Constitution. Then if I can move on to the issue around salary adjustments on page 173, uh, Chairperson, you asked the issue about wage agreements. The, it's, it's, a, it's the main reason why we are saying in our budget that we haven't made a, uh, a, a provision for, for this because uh, Chairperson, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, uh, a year or two ago, Tr Treasury moved the funding for those, at that stage, the initial uh, salary increases that was included in the budget. They removed over uh, a number of billion rand from our budget. So that's why we are moving from uh, what you can't see here, but we're moving actually from a basis of 25 billion to 28 billion rand. Um, that's why well, it's not in this book here, but that's basically where the jump came from. So we are very explicit to say that we haven't made uh, adjustment for uh, weights, for weight increases, and we are working with provincial treasury around that, given the uncertainty. Also, the fact that uh, government as a go as a whole uh, from national treasury is trying to contain the wage agree the wage bill as for government as a whole. As you know, that um, one of the main concerns from the World Bank and other uh, uh, institutions uh, for South Africa sustainability uh, going into the future, uh, notwithstanding the the COVID impact, is to drive the wage the wage bill down. And we as a department we are adhering to that. Uh, there is some level of understanding between us and our provincial treasury and the national treasury that if the wage agreement does come off in terms of if there's some sort of level of, of increases, that national treasury will have to fund that. That's our understanding around this particular aspect. Um, yeah, Chairperson, I think I've, I've covered my two areas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. If I may, just on the online, we have two projects on online streaming. We've got online streaming where we have a teacher at a school that has exceptional teaching abilities, then shares their lesson with six other schools, not necessarily within the same geographic area. It could be quite of a, an expansive area where that happens. We're also recording those lessons and sharing it with, with schools as well. That project is is almost about to start as we were in the throes of the procurement cycle when, when the Treasury note came out. So we're hoping to get that up and running as soon as possible. Uh, the second program that we are looking at is an additional uh, component to a school that functions as an online school as well. And it's a pilot project that we are currently busy with where teachers at a particular school are teaching online to a cohort of learners who do not actually attend school but log into to that particular program. We are extending that pilot to include two additional schools this year um, to also then just see what the impact of it is and using it as a study to establish the, 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 the possibility of expanding it even further. So we, we are on that. Then Chair, just if I may, on your question regarding a learner who is walking around and receiving a social grant, principals are required to sign a form to indicate that the learner has actually attended school. And that goes through to the social worker normally for the payment of the grant of that particular learner. So there is that control that we have um, from, from our side. But um, our, our, our teams, our SLES teams in our districts are always you know, assisting where possible with learners, uh, particularly those who are not attending school as often. And as, as mentioned by the minister, our truancy officers are trying to round up you know, learners as well. It's also required of a principal to actually call a parent of a child who is not present at school to establish the reasons for the child not being there. It's not a simple matter of just taking the child off the 
register of the school. The school actually has to go through a process of checking where the child is and, and establishing the reasons for that. And so those processes are in place to ensure that we mitigate and having more kids walking around on the streets. Thank you. I just want to check quickly um, and, and it might just be um, my ignorance and I'm still learning. So if I see a child on the street that is supposed to be in school and that I know that that household is getting a child grant, I can go to the principal and I can ask why this particular child is not in school. Uh, do I have the right to do that, to go to the principal and ask why is this kid not in school? Chairperson, as your position as the chair on the standing committee, I'm sure you'd be allowed to make that comment. I would appreciate it if you could also make it through to the provincial office and we can follow up on your behalf to establish the validity of it as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Now, I don't know of any particular example. I just wanted to know that I'm not going to upset anyone if I if I do do that particular process. Um, there's just one question from Member Karma, a part of his question that wasn't answered. Um, you did indicate the placement of learners. It's just what were the different strategies that you employed because you indicated previously there was, I think there was about 70 odd thousand learners that was unplaced. And because of those late applications, you brought it down to 340. Um, so what did you do now that was better than what you did previously? So that was a part of Member Karma's question that wasn't answered yet. Thanks. Chairperson, I think I did, I did answer that. I said we actually put a team uh, specifically working on this day and night. Um, over time, so we've got a better, uh, let's just say, reaction time in relation to placement. Um, so we had Mr. May. I said under Mr. Mayor's section in the district, there was a big, there's a big team of people actually working on it all the time. Uh, I think that's one. I think maybe just to add also, we also uh, got a lot more uh, promoted the idea a lot more. I think this year that parents might need to apply, you know, and we then we open up the system again and. So we're a little bit more on it this year, and I my expectation is we'll improve over time. That's my expectation. Okay, so the full-time complement, the full-time complement, how many people was it this time, this year? How many people helped you? The mayor, I will leave you <laughs> to give that. We have, Jeepers, we have around 21 people in a district at any, at any given time who are involved with admissions. And so during this, as the HUD correctly states, as from 1 January when we started, um, you know, no, sorry, not the first, <laughs> the second we started, we had a team action at, at the district at every point along the way to ensure that parents had contact. We also had a tent up for admissions at one of our districts, for example, where there was a high intake at Metro North. We actually had a tent where we then, you know, sort of triaged the parents that coming in as to you know admissions or you know or transfer or something like that, um, and so that are, those are some of the amendments that we've also made. But the team really is a, it's an ongoing uh, and full time um, you know occupation at the district at the moment. Perfect. Thank you so much, Member Brankes. I see your hand is up. Is it still on the section because I've closed the section technically already? But is this a follow up? Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's a follow-up. I, I saw that uh, because of yourself being the chair, you have the privilege of just uh, asking a question. You know, I was thinking. What uh, I'm doing is I want to make sure that they answer the question. That is exactly what I also wanted to do, but uh, through you, Chair. Through you. Thank you. What is your follow-up question? Uh, it's not actually a, a, a question, or maybe it is a question, Chair, that um, uh, to, to, to latch on to what you have asked the, 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 the department with regard to the actual, uh, if there's actually a procedure, if seeing, uh, for, for example, a child on the, on the street, that uh, what the procedure is in, 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 in helping that child, you know, uh, 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 option should, could probably be to go to the principal or to go to the school. But now the department said that uh, it is probably best to contact the department you know, so that they can take, take up the matter. So what my question is, is that the, uh, 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 the actual procedure or isn't there a, a special procedure in place of tackling uh, issues relating to, to education? For example, like seeing a child on the street. Okay, so basically what you're saying is you appreciate that I asked, what do we do when the child's on the street? And the answer was, we can either speak to the principal, but also can we please let Mr. Walters know that we've spoken to the principal about this kid on the street. So that it's not just the principal on the ground that knows, then Mr. Walter and the department also then it also knows. What I want I'm to sure add Mr. Walters will give his email address to everyone in this committee. 
that I'm clear on is, but my, my, but my question actually is is, 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 is that the procedure? That was confirmed today. I asked, what do I do? And you told me I go to the principal, but I must also let you guys know. So, Perfect. so Chair, that, 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 that uh, actually means that uh, we as members uh, in, in, in this uh, instance now and yourself as the chair also, so we don't have the authority actually to go to go to the school or to approach the, the principal. So that is, is that, if I may ask. Remember, you are a member of parliament and you have a right to do oversight. So if you see a kid on the street that is supposed to be going to school, you can go to the principal and ask, why is this kid on the school? Please do something about it. So I'm, I'm going to come back to you because I think this is probably a conversation we need to also have informally about how the how you go and how you introduce yourself and stuff like that. But that's more operational things and logistics. Member Syed. Thank you, Chair. Chair, mine is just a follow up. I'm not going yet into the next. I, I think just member Brinkheiser's thing, that's fine. I think maybe the department, he, I think what he wanted was maybe just confirmation that this is the policy, but that's fine. Just on the Groot Kral issue, uh, the MEC responded. I note the response, but I think I don't think the and she indicated the department's going to give some more detail. Can we maybe just get some more detail? Because my understanding is there that the school itself was transporting the children. And then the the son of the former, I think he's a former principal or whatever, uh, Mr. Matembo, the son was a subcontractor. That's my understanding, but I think maybe just, and then the WCD canceled the school's contract. The claim there from the SGB and the community is that there was no consultation in that cancellation. Perhaps maybe just shed light and respond in that specific regard. That's just my follow up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. So I think just on the, obviously we'll clarify maybe in some writing in relation to uh, members approaching principals because there are other issues about COVID-19 and also our ability to know what is actually happening. So if, you know, just, I just maybe we'll take that in a different conversation if you could, please, Chairperson. And then I'll ask Mr. Abrams uh, if you could perhaps just answer the question with Rutka. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on the matter of Groot Kral, the um, short input on the backdrop, the Western Cape Education Department administers learner transport within a policy framework. It allows for two types of learner transport arrangements. One is where we centrally administer that and award a contract to a service provider. Uh, the alternative to that is where we have a devolved route where monies, based on a quantification of what that transport arrangement looks like, monies are then transferred to the school and the school administers the transport arrangement in putting a service provider um, in place and, and operationalizing the service. Uh, so that's not unique to Groot Kral. We have that model in many places where, for various reasons, um, the school um, plays a role in procuring the services. Uh, as it relates to, to Groot Kral, um, the conditions under which uh, that arrangement is obviously approved, we expect that those compliance conditions are met. And in that case, the conditions were not met and a decision had been uh, a recommendation had been received from the district, which had been approved, that we um, reconsider the devolved and as a result uh, of the, the investigation, that devolved uh, arrangement was cancelled. Um, the department had put in alternative centrally administered transport arrangements. It had a, assigned a contractor for continuity of services. The children coming from Oatswaran, for example, were transported to school and a contractor was um, procured via the district. The school, um, as many schools, all schools have the prerogative to do, had continued to offer private transport, and that is not part of the arrangement that the WCD plays a role in oversighting. That's the equivalent of private transport. Any parent or any member of society or community could transport children. Um, so I'd like to set the, the context that the department had for continuity purposes, put its alternative arrangement in place when it canceled the devolved route and procured a service from, from a company locally, uh, and the school had continued to transport learners, the difference being that the school were not being handed um, a subsidy or an allocation of, of, of an amount. Uh, it did that with presumably with own or other funding. Um, so the, the, the conflict in that regard 
is around alternative transport arrangements now being available and parents had, uh, had been engaged on that. To the members, um, question around the level of consultation. There had been full consultation, not just on the transport matter, but the, the functioning of the school and whether the school governing body had been exercising its authority in, in, in a way that's compliant. And, and, and so there's a broader conversation around um, the, the district and, and school governance um, or governing bodies around governance matters. And transport was the key issue that that, committee, that, that governing body or that district and, and governing body uh, engaged on. The decision to um, cancel the devolved route is the one that's contentious. And so I, I take on board the feedback that there's a view that there wasn't either uh, any or sufficient consultation, but I think that it could also show that we had uh, notified the school governing body um, about our intent to investigate and then to um, move in a different direction. That had full approval from the appropriate uh, um, uh, authorities, the HOD uh, as well. Um, I, I just, through you, Chair, I'm, I'm not sure if that, uh, I just want to make a link to the other learner transport question that the member had asked. We had as a WCED in the last uh, two weeks, met with representatives who presented themselves as the regional leadership of two particular taxi associations in the Western Cape, um, Carta and Codeta. Um, the uh, nature of that engagement was we had uh, services that were um, well, clearly were disrupted. Children were not being picked in areas of Kailicha and, and other places. Um, and some of the feedback, which had obviously come through various sources, official sources and from the public, and that there had been disruption. Um, and our operators, for example, were telling us that they were prevented from picking up children or dropping off children in school. But the, the question was around, so what is the nature of that engagement? The nature of engagement was that we had made a commitment to provide information to, quote unquote, the taxi industry, the local taxi industry around A, our learner transport scheme and the policies around that, the five kilometer radius uh, as a condition for state-sponsored travel, for example, um, but also give clarity and insight into the procurement processes, the open uh, the tender processes that we engage in and the length and term of contracts and so on and so forth, conditions for you know, qualifying operators to transport children. And it's largely a service that, of course, runs in the rural context where distances between home and school is more than five kilometers. But we recognize that side by side with being able to provide schools in community or in proximity to where learners are, where we may not be able to do that in the city of Cape Town, we might want to initiate on an exception basis a transport arrangement from, say, Delft to Bondeville or Delft to Hope Bay, whatever the case may be. And so the queries in that regard around where are we going with city-based transport of learners and what's the process around that, the broader question is what is the role and what, what could the role of the taxi industry be? And I say quote unquote because I think the nature of the question is a broad general question around procurement of learner transport services and the members of the taxi industry presented themselves in that regard. We um, were very clear as a resolution of that meeting that uh, no disruption to current existing learner transport would continue. So that was the first commitment that we would work together to ensure that whilst um, there were claims of a dispute. There were no claims. There were no disputes between the WC and the taxi associations. There were questions asked around the role that the taxi industry plays and questions around procurement. We fulfilled that. And then the other commitment was in response to a question around can there be a more meaningful role that the taxi industry could play if on an ongoing basis we are continuing to transport learners as part of government uh, paid travel uh, in the city of Cape Town. Can we explore what that looks like? Um, the commitment was that those, uh, as you know, the representatives from the department had no mandate in that regard. We committed to put that uh, to the appropriate, uh, to, to the minister and to the HOD, uh, and potentially also broader into Western Cape government. Minister Mitchell and others in the Department of Transport, it's not a transport, it's not a competency we have. So I'm painting a, a broad picture, but I think the question being asked, because it is at the heart of service delivery, it is how does a child get safely from home to school who are our partners in that regard to ensure that that happens. And the taxi industry is obviously, uh, the transport as an access medium is a relevant thing. So there was a quite a, a productive and engaging conversation. Um, we resolved um, that what matters most is that children get back to school and get there safely and back home. And that any discussions around the nature of a partnership obviously is in the broader context of procurement standards and strategies, but also, the question was, you know, general, is is the taxi industry 
relevant and can it be um, play a, a more meaningful role in transporting children? Loads of conditions, Chair, and I think I just wanted to set the expectation. It's an ongoing conversation, but uh, a healthier one that, you know, there's no, there's no threat of discontinuity to service delivery. And I think that context, if that was the case, then we will um, consider all options for all uh, private sector partners potentially who can help deliver uh, services in, 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 in the interest of getting children to school and keeping them there. Thank you. So maybe Chairperson, if I could just go back to the truancy issue which was raised. Uh, so officials indicate uh, here to me now and I want to put it into the record so that you know perhaps what's the process. Um, so the, the quickest way to get it reported is not to clog my inbox. <laughs> quickest way to get it reported is to phone a safe schools number. 0800 45 46 47. Um, and then we have school safety field workers in the district who then will follow up. So then I think if you know to report it, it's fine. You can send an email. But I think to get a quick reaction, perhaps to test that number. Uh, and then obviously report back to us how it works. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think in a place like the metro, it's a little bit more difficult because you don't know which school the, the child is supposed to go to. In a place like my previous constituency was Langsburg, there's one high school, so it's only one high school that you can go to. So I pick up the phone and I phone the principal. Um, colleagues, we're going to now go to pages 175 until 184. I see uh, member Christian's hand. I see member Syed's hand. I see member Karma's hand. I don't see anything online in that order. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll skip program three. I'll go to program four. With special schools education. Um, just the one question, and and and, and uh, you know, um, I've been to, been to uh, certain of the special schools. Um, just the stigma. What is the? Is it on? Yeah. What does the department do to? You know, there's a stigma attached to special needs. They call it the dom school or something. Uh, what is the department doing, uh, you know, to, because I, I, I believe, and we all believe it plays a role, you know, when we learn as con cope in the mainstream and go to special. So, so what is the department doing on that? Um, just a, a, a specific case that I, I, I want to mention is um, I've been to the Bethel um, special school um, and met with the principal because of, um, the problems that they have with burglaries. And I mean, you know, you have a, a beautiful school and it's been burgled so many times. Um, and I have sent a, a, a letter to the minister and I had uh, I have a response on that because the fence is broken for some long, long, long time now. And they reported the matter and the, the, the people is walking through the fence, burgling the school. They've I, I think you know the circumstances out there. The hostel, the girls' hostel is completely gone. Uh, everything has been stolen. Um, they stored the beds in the swimming pool area that's enclosed. That wall was broken. I've even had a meeting with the police um, two days ago. I reported them for poor service delivery uh, by the provincial commissioner, and that escalated to the station commander of Kells River. So just, you know, um, it's sad to see that we have a beautiful school and being vandalized. I can't understand that why it's taking so long to, to, to repair that fence because people are walking in. They're spending about 40,000 rand a month on security. And yet the security can't because they can't be all over. And people, uh, you know, so I, we took all the cases to the police too because I think the police also got a role to play. But... The question is because, you know, uh, member side always talk about fencing, fencing, and we see 30 more fences doing, but but here you have a, a, a problem uh, and it can be solved with the fencing because people walking in and out and, and, and yet, you know, it's not been, like I said, I've written to the to the minister, there's, I've got responses and I said this at the infrastructure team at the moment, but if I can maybe just get uh, you know, uh, what? what is the, uh, because they've reported it months ago, I've reported a month ago, and uh, still the, we, we, we're sitting with a school that's very vulnerable, people being robbed, uh, you know, um, uh, in school, in the school premises. So, so just, to, I, I just wanted to bring that specific case. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Kama. Oh, no, I apologize. It's Member Syed first. 
two questions, member Syed, member Carmen, yeah. member Allen online also wants to ask questions. No, no, thank you very much. Eh? Mine, I mean, yeah, mine is just page 183, table 9.4, summary of payments and estimates, uh, program four with the public special school education. It kind of speaks to issues raised by member Christians. I just wanted to, in the foreground, get a sense as to um, can the department possibly provide us with the amounts for this program that were uncommitted, you know, um, not spent and surrendered to the Provincial Revenue Fund? Because I think it's a very, very important program that's your special schools. Because there's a case that we've got, and I just wanted to get a sense if could maybe respond. And we welcome the fact that the Kailicha Special School is now functioning and operating from this year onwards. But there's been quite a few concerns um, that have been raised, particularly with myself, and we'll bring it to your attention. Is that, as you know, that was a school that has been converted now into a uh, special school. And the school in the first place it was obviously set up first not to be a special school, but now it's a special school. My concern is that to this date now, even though there's been a conversion, the structural modification of the school, uh, it hasn't yet been structurally modified to accommodate the special needs of the learners of that school. So you've got, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's various needs that the learners have. Poor vision, epilepsy, Down syndrome, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, I just wanted to get a sense, do we have an update as to how far we are in terms of the structural modifications for the school to actually fully function as a special needs school? Thank you. Well done, Member Syed. Member Kama. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my, my chair would be on 177. Uh, I was going to ask two questions there, but uh, let me ask one so that I ask the other one later. Uh, so, so my question, Chair, I, I, there on the earmarked uh, allocations, uh, page 177. Uh, I, I want to focus mainly on the MOD programs and, and just uh, check with the department, maybe in the discussions with this DCAS, uh, are, are there any discussions on the possibility of uh, expanding the program? Uh, and, and, and also where there are few neighboring schools partic participating in a particular MOD program uh, what is the view in that regard? But the second question that I have, Chair, is on 180, uh, 182. And in that um, page, I want to just understand, I think, Table 9.3 on the summary of payment and, and estimates for Program 3 independent schools. I, I just want to get the reasons of the for the 11% increase for the independent uh, school subsidies in view uh, HOD of the, the short discussion that we might have had around the inequalities and, and the gap between your poor schools and your public schools and the, the need for more funding in your public uh, schools. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. Member Kama's not getting a gold star anymore because he promised me one question and he still asked to <laughs> Member Allen. Thank you um, so much, Chairperson. Am I audible? Yes, Member Allen, you can go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I was following um, the round of questions in terms of the special schools and i also want to latch on it um i'm sorry if i'm going to i'm going to add over to what members already indicated um so 182 makes mention of the public special schools um i have noted that on the app um on page 44 um regarding infrastructure development um 
are we able to get an indication from um, from the HOD um, or give direction on where we get that full infrastructure development um, for special schools? Because uh, my question is essentially then um, in developing the special schools um, resource center that I've also noted in the APP, um, there was mention made that we are looking to develop special schools into special school resource centers um, who then use the expertise to assist teachers and learners in ordinary schools. Um, do we have a plan in that regard that we are able to um, to look at or get some further information? Because in my mind, I'm just a uh, member. Christians also mentioned part of it that how will this be managed specifically when we consider that there's an increase in demand for placement in special schools as well. Um, and then um, a part B to that question would be um, on special schools, Chairperson, um, and the streams, no, on special streams um, that could potentially be opened at ordinary schools. Um, if the department is able to give some further information in that regard um, on how special streams at ordinary schools will receive attention um, for implementation and expansion um, for this um, upcoming financial year. Thank you. Thank you. I see the members of this committee is very innovative. Uh, my question is, I don't see any other hands online, so my question that just relates to page 179 and the sub-program 2.1 and 2.2. I just want to understand, um, is the home learning project, is that similar to the, the pilot that you that you spoke about uh, where kids are learning from home digitally through the, the department and so on, through these teachers that have these special um, skills to, to teach online and the two schools that you want to include? Now, I just want to get some more info on that home learning project and related to that particular pilot, um, if we do know of schools where, for example, kids might want to learn a particular subject, but there might only be two or three in that school that might be interested, and therefore the resources isn't necessarily enough to, for example, assign a permanent teacher. Um, is, is that perhaps an avenue that we can, can, can try and figure out so that those particular children are able to take part in those subjects without us significantly increasing um, particular financial resources. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Sorry, sorry, SG, I won't be long. I'll just take a few. Um, I just want to make a general comment about special schools. I mean, it is a huge concern and there is, certainly is a, a um, increasing demand for places in those schools. Um, as far as the perception is concerned, well, that's also a public perception. We're doing whatever we can to try and, and uh, get rid of that perception. The same applies also a little bit to technical and vocational education, which is very much needed in our economy. And I think we all need to take that message out there to our constituencies to, to show people that it's not an inferior kind of education, that it's just a different kind of education, and that it's equally important and equally needed in society. In fact, very often that enables you to better to have a better chance of getting a job than the what you a you know, normal academic stream might. But on the special schools, what's really concerned me recently is given our budget woes that we've had over the last number of years, I've done a lot of uh, investigating and into the budget. And what concerns me is that there has been, as part of the equitable share calculation, the formula, there has not been, special schools have not been included in the allocation. And as we know, they all cost a lot more money because people need extra resources and uh, and that has not been included. Uh, and there's been a recent uh, question at the National Assembly about that and the answer was that it was unaffordable. So I don't find that particularly acceptable. Um, we have to provide, we're obliged to provide and we want to provide places for learners with special needs. And it really is concerning that only public ordinary schools have been taken into account in that calculation. Uh, we also, I think, have the highest number of special schools in the country, if I'm not correct. I may be mistaken, but I think I'm correct. And we certainly do give a really good quality education for our special needs learners within what we have to, to you know, within our budget constraints. But it certainly is a big demand. So that is a concern. Um, and then I just also want to... Uh, what is the other issue? 
I just think we need to also understand that independent schools, remember Karma, independent schools don't mean wealthy schools. The subsidies don't go to the bishops and the Herschels of this world. They are very many small little independent schools, often community kind of schools. Um, and those are the schools that back it up. But I'll leave the finance people to give more details on that. Um, and then just a, just to remember a question. Yes, I've received your complaint, and yes, we know about the issues there. But I want to ask another question. At what point is government expected to just keep on fixing things that people break? Because it's costing us a fortune. And how are we going to change the mindset that it's okay to break down fences at schools, that it's okay to walk in and, and steal things and break things that we've built? Because until we get we're going to and I don't, it really worries me that people do that. I mean, yes, I know there should be fences and there often are fences, but very often the fences are being broken down by the very people who now use those opportunities to go and trash the rest of the school. And it really is concerning to me. But yes, I'll, I'll ask um, if Mr. Abrams has an answer as to what we're going to do at that school to try and secure it in the meantime. But I mean, we have to get our communities on board to look after the assets that we build. Thank you, um, SG. Thank you very much, Minister Chairperson. May we continue? Thank you. OK, so so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Answered a few of the questions and maybe just on inclusive education. Uh, maybe just to distinguish in terms of special schools, right? They're also schools of skills. They're also technical schools that regard as special schools. Uh, you were referring to, I think, the question of special schools for learners with disability in some way. Um, what do we do? But I think the approach is you know, on a, in our APP on page 69, we actually outline all the activities that we will engage in for inclusive education. Um, every child has a right to education if they're in certain age band, um, as of course you know in the constitution. So therefore we have to provide uh, these these uh, facilities. So obviously we also, Mr. Said in his uh, uh, question also mentioned about different kinds of disabil disabilities, okay? Now, one of the disabilities that also we, we're struggling with now is autism. It seems to be something that has come in the modern age, which wasn't perhaps there 20 years ago. How do we deal with that? So I think just to say, I mean, this capacity building uh, for inclusive flagship schools in every circuit, we provide early intervention and support on site. Uh, we've got assistive technology. We provide ICT services to, to these schools. Um, we provide access to learning programs for children who have profound intellectual disability in special care centers by multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, we disseminate information on barriers to learning and how to overcome those barriers and so on is, I think, uh, detailed there. Um, I think the questions on infrastructure, Mr. Abrams, if you could just deal with uh, the ones that were asked, but I do want to comment on the minister's comment, which I agree with completely. You know, you put up a fence and then people break the fence. You put up another fence and then people break that fence. I think we've got to ask ourselves that, that question, to answer that question is beyond the education department. It's a society question. So th this may help or may not help. Checkers. But you know, one of the departments I worked in before was the department that dealt with statues and heritage and so on. One of the key sort of takeaways there, being a non-expert in that, that I was told is that People will protect what they value. So you need to spend a lot of time in actually working with a community to try and get them to understand this is actually your facility. That is beyond us here in this room. That is everybody in our society that needs to do that. I think, you know, um, inside communities, because, I mean, we can't keep on putting up fences and people break them down and we need to put up another fence. At which point do we say, no, sorry, man, you know, we actually there's maybe a community that's more worthy. And I think, Chairperson, if I may say, or be bold to say, as public representatives, I think that's something that you need to start a conversation about with the communities you serve, uh, to start to talk about that. Because as the education department, we can we can say, but obviously your public representatives, um, people, I think a conversation in South Africa needs to be had about that. Um, the value that we put on things. Um, why do people do that? Why do they just break down the fence? Uh, Mr. Evans has many horror stories. People break down a fence just because it was a shortcut. No other reason, not even a reason for like, oh, I actually wanted to use this for something because, uh, you know, I could sell it for scrap metal. That that could be a reason. But people just know you you, you interfere with my shortcut here. Yeah, let me break this fence. 
So I think just to just to maybe say that that would require what we have called in our uh, government sector as across departments, all of government, but also all of society, not just the education department. So, you know, to be able to to solve that issue. I just want to perhaps want to say that. I think then if I can ask Mr. Mayer to deal with questions on uh, the mod program and uh, discussions with you, Mr. Mahmoud and Mr. A or Mr. Mayer, mod program discussions with DCAS as to, uh, you know, where we're going to take that. I think the issue also just in relation to the uh, increases for independent schools, Mr. Eli, you will just mention on the on the budget side, but I just want to say this. My opening remarks, I think Member Kama raises in the opening remarks, I did actually mention that part of our funding will be going to uh, making certain that we have more no fee schools. Right? So there's this is a balanced system. Um, we've got to also understand that private education is growing. That's a fact. Um, it does take pressure off our system because if children are inside that system, then it means on the public system, it means that on the numbers number side of it, we are actually able to cope now. So clearly it's a double, it's a double thing, it's a dual thing that we do have to do, and therefore we, I think we supported it um, inside in that way. Uh, Mr. Allen had asked about infrastructure, if um, we can maybe just talk about that, and there's a question about streaming, Mr. Mahmoud, which I think you need to perhaps just um, answer. And Mr. Mahmoud, if you could also answer the question on Atom Learning, what that what that project was about. Um, and then finally, I think Chairperson, you had asked, about this, this issue of like three children, like they're doing physical science, you know. Our response to that is normally our response to be, well, okay, those three children, maybe that school mustn't offer that subject, and those three children must transfer to another school. But online may give us a different opportunity. Because it may mean, it may mean that through that, so, so we haven't worked at the modalities, but just on a headline basis. When you have those, I'm going to say, oh no, I'm just careful not, not call it particular. When you have a specific subject choices that aren't popular, and because remember now, especially in the FET band, right, 10 to 12, that's actually what puts pressure on the system when you have all these choices. Because now we are funding a school based on 40 learners per class, just making that as an equation. But now when you take that same 40 class, class of 40, and they then break up into three different classrooms for three different subjects, 12 year and five year and like that, then that's not messing with the whole with the whole numbers. Now the online, what we are seeing is that this is why we've argued from a strategic point of view, not only from an uptake for younger for, for learners, it's better at the older phase, but also if we were to look at where the pressure is inside the system and what's causing it, it's a choice at the top of the system that's causing the pressure lower down. So in the online space, it's about going in there strategically and saying, okay, are there things we can actually do here to maybe take pressure off? And you mentioned three learners, but maybe an opportunity to have a streaming issue with three learners, uh, you know, because now they don't actually have to change schools. They can sit in another space, maybe even on a device and tune in, maybe in the store room, I don't know. But that can be worked out, and I think that's the opportunity that online does bring to us, and that's, that's the future road that we probably will have to go. But I'm going to ask my colleagues if they could perhaps just answer Mr. Maybe starting with you, Mr. Evans, on the infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just on the um, Betel, uh, the member, um, Betel is on the list for offence in this coming financial year. Um, I acknowledge the infrastructure team has just confirmed they have received the the communication, but I think the the situation in Betel also with input from the safe schools teams and, and other inputs, we have acknowledged is quite a desperate situation. So the school is on the list for the coming financial year. So that we'll share that feedback with the school community as well. And, and perhaps j just to explain that there is, of course, a, a process for um, for putting schools on that list. I mean, I acknowledge that there's a quite a broad demand for that. Um, so just a, a, a few statements. The WCD had, of course, cleared in the norms and standards sort of context. Every school has a fence. If it doesn't have a fence, it's because there's a reason, either for mentioned before vandalism, theft, etc., or just deterioration. Or the quality of the fence, obviously, in that situational context, is just not effective. Um, we talk about bulletproof, bulletproof fences now. We talk about scaled walls and so forth. So fences are used as a generic kind of concept. But the process is such that we've identified 150 uh, schools in vulnerable or violent contexts where, as part of uh, 
improving safety and security for those who use the school grounds. The 150 schools came onto a program that we committed funding for, and we 90 schools into that 150 um, school program. So at the end of year two, we've completed three years of programmed fence installations, helped, of course, by the additional amount allocated in the 2020-2021 year. That has allowed us to add um, the, the, the latter part, year four and year five schools onto this year's program. And so effectively an acceleration and Betel then comes into, into that scope. Safety in the context of our provincial priorities uh, and perimeter security, I should say, is, is a priority and we've put, put money and I've just set an expectation um, accelerating um, the fencing program is part of what we think we're going to do with the additional funding allocation for infrastructure. On the members questions through, through you, Chair, on the members questions around the structural modifications at special schools. Um, I probably wouldn't at this point be able to speak to the strategy to build out the special resource centres. Suffice it to say, we acknowledge that um, with all the service delivery pressure to accommodate, we have, with all the backdrop that the Minister and HD has sketched, special needs education, inclusive education, and, and allowing and building for the enabling facilities, not just accessibility, ramps and so forth, uh, good uh, spaces for auditory and, and visual kind of context. Um, but it does need a deeper consultation around what, what is the need. So from an equitable access point of view, we are um, allocating funding in this coming year to improving um, and making modifications at special needs schools. Kailicha School, to the member through the chairs, is on that list for the basics of um, improving accessibility, um, but also looking at other structural modifications will be guided on by the specialists, the occupational therapists, et cetera, um, who work in these spaces and can guide on the investments we need to make. So there's a very definite, uh, with a budget available, uh, plan to, to Im improve that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Chair Pearson, uh, on the issue of the mod centres, we acknowledge um, as one of our indicators of functional schools that the school has an after-school activity. And so therefore, the discussions with DCAS will continue to look at the expansion of the program. And I agree with you that sometimes the neighboring schools are not necessarily as eager to participate. And so we do encourage those centers to go to increase their geographic um, kind of area they wish to cover to, to engage with schools to, to participate in the program. So, the, so there are definitely discussions around that that are happening. I want to respond to member Allen's question regarding the the special schools um, within a, within within the public ordinary school. And so we have schools that are that are classified as full service schools, where we do cater for learners with um, various learning challenges. And we are at the at the current moment we are investigating and and having a look at that at that structure because there's no clear norms and standards defined by the DBE yet at, around those, uh, those uh, full service schools um, so that we then are able to cater with learners with differing abilities within one, within one school. Uh, those schools at the moment from the district side are supported by specialists um, to support not only the learners at that particular school, but also schools in the neighboring area uh, where there are learners who are having um, specific challenges. Also within our schools, we have learning support advisors or educators at our schools who are there to assist learners who have learning challenges with reading or basic numeracy um, to support learners across the public ordinary schools as well to reach levels of proficiency within those specific areas. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair, on the question of the at-home learning project. So this started as a pilot. We, at the moment, in 52 schools, we started with about um, 18 schools in 2020. These are in poor and vulnerable communities, main locations being Fowl East, Dallenbosch, Malmesbury. As we speak, we, um, we've received interest from ECK to uh, continue the program. Basically, what we found was that over COVID period in these communities, there was no learning happening. So it's a, a mitigation measure for uh, learning losses. And we managed to get uh, funding from DDAT who are funding at the moment about 100 interns. These interns work as a relay between the children, the school, and the home. And we've got on record about 5,000 visits that we've done um, to families to encourage um, the establishment of a learning system or a learning culture um, in the home. Um, 
the feedback we've been getting is is very very positive but as we speak um, every day there is an additional learning program available to the children in those in and around those 52 schools uh, in the nutshell share that that's the we can provide lots more information thank you One last page. It's the last um, chairperson. Also on the learner with that, those three learners at the school, for example, in Lanesdale, in Lanesburg, we also have the telematics program uh, where learners can actually get tuition in those specific subjects as well. That is perhaps not offered at the school. Those lessons are also available as recordings um, that, that learners could access um, off, offline as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. I want to take the follow ups now. I think everyone probably realized what I was talking about in Langsburg. You may know, um, obviously, there's no mathematics in that in that high school. And while I'm not the constituency um, chairperson of, of head, what do you call it, of that area anymore, it's still very close to my heart because many of those kids I assisted with applications to get into university. And yesterday I got some SMSs from one of the some of the kids who said to the one of the counselors, you must tell Auntie Deirdre we got in and the one is doing now civil engineering, the other two is a Stellenbosch. And they said I must now come and visit them to see how they're doing. Um, so it's very close to my heart because if you don't have mathematics in a high school, there's very few things you can apply to for post-school options. And, and I think for, for schools in rural areas, um, they're not necessarily asking for a full-time teacher because they do understand the, the constraints on resources. But for us to just maybe think a bit more innovatively in how do we get those three or four kids to be able to take mathematics so that they can be those engineers who end up working at the wind farms within the areas or even within the agriculture sector within their own areas. I saw Member Syed's hand for a follow-up question. Any other questions on these pages? Going once, going twice. Member Syed? Okay, which means maybe I can do two follow-ups because yes, no, no, no. Thank you very much. Uh, my first follow-up, just on the issue of the fencing. I know Member Christians knows that that's one of my pet uh, uh, projects, <laughs> but I didn't raise the initial question, but I thought just, um, I, 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 I think that's a good point to raise that now look, there is, it speaks to a deeper societal problem. And I think we need to get on board um, the whole of society. I think it needs to be a community effort to actually protect our schools. Um, uh, just however, I think we also need to deal beyond just the issue of the vandalizing, but there have been schools, for example, if you go to Welcome Primary, I visited Mr. Walters yesterday around just to assist him with the chess program. But what I picked up there is that the, that fence has been there since uh, I think 70, close on to almost 70 years. So those type of cases, I just wanted to get a sense as to what do we, what do we have in place to ensure that not where there's been vandalism, but where the fence is actually decaying and it's out of date now, you know, and that then creates some vulnerability for the school. Then number two, um, and I think it's an issue, it's, it's, it's a point that we've raised in the public domain before. It's a follow up to uh, Mr. Eli's point about the need to roll out more no fee schools. Now that also speaks to a challenge, which I must say, while and the MEC, she's still here, she knows I'm, Highly critical on many issues when it comes to the department, but on this one, I don't think the department is at fault here, but I think we need to, it's the issue of the quintile system. Here, I think the fight needs to be taken to the doorstep of national government and the national department, really. Uh, I think the criteria that's still set by national as to how a school gets its quintile state is con it, it, it's extremely outdated. Uh, it's not in it's not speaking to the current socio-economic context that's facing communities where a quintile school or a, a school is given a quintile status based on the area profile, not necessarily based on the kind of economic background of the learners that are coming to the school. We've been raising this issue. Uh, in 
other spaces in which we sit. But I think I want to get a sense from the department because we have discussed this is what's the level of conversation and lobbying happening from a Western Cape side for that actually to be changed. And I think then later, maybe when we do the resolutions as a committee, I think, Chair, we must actually call DBE in uh, and have a conversation with WCED in that same meeting. But let's call DBE in and hold them to account in that regard, because it's unacceptable that we still have an archaic uh, policy around the quintile system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister and HOD. Um, answers, um, please. And I think Member Side will even be able to assist us with some of the cell phone numbers of the national counterparts. Thank you, Chair Now I just had to pick myself off my chair quickly. Um, thank you very much, Member Side. I will happily take up your offer. Um, we have had engagements over many years with DBE. Um, in fact, the previous term already, um, I raised it quite near the beginning of my term because I obviously could see it was a problem. They did an investigation and said that there was uh, it was unaffordable because the only option is um, fee schools versus no fee schools. That was the only other option. I'm not convinced that that is the only option. Um, I think there should be more uh, work done on funding per learner based on their affordability. Um, so I would be very happy if we were to join uh, forces on that issue to try and change the system because it is it really is not um, working. So I do want to thank you for that, um, and I also want to thank you for your um, for your agreement to try and assist with um, getting communities to understand that infrastructure is just not something that needs to be broken down. And if we can work together on that and change some culture in society, I think we'll make a huge, huge impact in our province. Um, the other issues, um, if I can leave to the HD, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Abrams. Uh, I think the question is for you. <laughs> uh, it's, thank you. I mean, I, I interpret, thank you, Chair. I interpret the member's question around, um, again, a reference to a particular school. So, so welcome, for example, um, is not on the list, but I think we will um, acknowledge that when we say there is a fence, of course, the quality and the and the technology that's being deployed is or has been deployed over in that case over many years clearly is outdated and not effective and so um perhaps the caveat is that we will continue to improve fences where they where they are out of date and not effective and we of course have the support of the safe schools uh, team as well who identify obviously priorities um but i think the the clarity that might help as well is that our uh, prioritization has been based on the communities and the context. So um, welcome, of course, um, if I understand my own geography knowledge, it's close to Haderfeld, Haderfeld and down Cliffentain Road. Um, there are schools are obviously on the list. And I make that reference because it's very hard to distinguish one school down in 500 meters down the road from the other. They share the same context. And um, I, I made a reference to Menenberg where um, more schools rightfully are asking in the current context um, of, of the violence going on, can they have the fences improved? So, Chair, what I'm responding to is acknowledging that welcome and schools in that position um, that have fences that clearly are not effective, that haven't been replaced in a long while and should probably be replaced um, with additional uh, funding that we have on the principle of bolstering safety and security, um, we will we will consider all all. Um, all requests and I think um, principals and through the schools we will encourage schools as well and school governing bodies to to raise their hands and the questions we will follow up very quickly with to the points made previously is that especially those schools that do not have neighbors in close proximity looking over the school uh, a, a community wrapped around the school where the lighting for example is particularly bad it needs a firstly a whole of society approach which has been called for but probably a broader infrastructure response. So the fence is not enough in some context. And I think when the questions are raised around, can we have a replaced fence at two and a half million rand, we will probably say there are other things in your context that would need to be looked at as well, uh, given um, rife vandalism, given theft, what else can we do? Otherwise that would be clearly an investment that will be very short lived. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, um, and and thank you also to Member Side for raising it. I think I'm always in various different minds when it comes to fencing. Mm -hmm. There was once this director at, at my alma mater, and and there was a, a crime in this one street close to that university, 
And and a lot of people all of a sudden says, no, we're not going to walk down. All the students are not going to walk down the street anymore. And this director came and he went to every single student house. And he said, we will walk down that street. And he said, the reason we will walk down that street is, is because by leaving the street, you're actually making the street more unsafe. So we are now all going to collectively keep walking down the street to show people that we all own the street, doesn't belong to some people. And, and, and he said also, and this is the same thing he tells people sometimes when we're building houses. If I put up a fence in front of my house, it makes my neighbor sometimes feel unsafe. So my neighbor now also, also all of a sudden put up a fence. When I get an alarm system, and all of a sudden, sometimes my neighbor also now get an alarm system because now there's the perception that I need to get an alarm system in this particular neighborhood. And so things start escalating and snowballing and snowballing. And it's a very difficult concept to deal with because it's how someone feels. Um, and that is something very, very difficult to deal with. And in Langsburg at the Akasha Primary School, when the minister came for oversight and the previous HOD, we, um, they actually asked the principal, why do you have such a low dropout rate? Why is there so little vandalism? And the principal's answer was, I walked through the streets and I knocked on the doors and I told the parents, this is your school. This is your children's school. Please don't break things down. Your child must come to school. And the kids came to school and the vandalism decreased. And I'm not saying that this will happen in every single community because communities obviously have different contexts. But for me, that was just a very fascinating story of how one community dealt with an issue like that. Colleagues, um, I'm now going to just ask that we just take a short comfort break. It is now 11.21. If we can return at 11.40, it gives us 19 minutes for comfort break. Um, and then we will commence with pages 185 up until 194. Thank you. Oh, um, for those who are here in person, there is tea um, and coffee in the in the members' lounge. Thank you.
Thank you for your patience with the extra few minutes. Colleagues, we are now on pages 185 until 194. Okay, I will take hands now. I see member Christians. I see member Syed. I see member Karma. Are there any hands online? I see member Allen. Okay, in that order, thank you. Pages 185 to 194. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, page 185. Um, we're talking about, and I heard it's also on the pages what the HOD said, that uh, the ECDs will now be uh, with the department from the 1st of April. Uh, just, just a question. Um, I'm, I'm asking that question because uh, I'm going to ask that question because we have a problem when it comes to learners um, enrolling timelessly, right? The department do everything, uh, but but still we have learners. Uh, will this assist you now with uh, the ECDs, with children coming from the ECD system to uh, seeing that the department have a direct role over that now? And how are you going to bolster that ECD system in order to link children to be prepared to go to school. The, 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 the big problem that I have is because still at grade three and four, learners can't read properly uh, because they can only fail once in the cycle and then they put over. And uh, when I spoke to the principals and teachers, I say it's only basic things that they can read. They can't read properly. So I'm just thinking, you know, with, with the Department of Education now having his hand in sooner, Will that help us with admissions to schools because you want those learners to come from that? And are we encouraging learn? I don't know how big the system is and it cannot take the ECD program because you work with, you know, NGOs and so on. Is that big enough to, uh, you know, to, to prepare our children to go to, to grade one uh, to, for, for reading and, and those type of things? And also um, uh, now working with, uh, with the different NGOs, you know, uh, People get deregistered because of not complying. What's happening in that regard? And is there some funding spent on that? Just, I, I, I think that is just what I wanted to know. How is this going to assist us taking us forward? Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Said. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and welcome back to the department. Um, page 187, uh, program number six, infrastructure development. Can I just get a sense, can the department give us an update on how many mobile classrooms were completed of the 46 that it anticipated between December 2021 and January 2022? And, uh, um, and how far they were the two new mobile schools that were, anticipate, that were anticipated to be completed by the end of term one? Then page 190. Um, page 190, uh, sub-program 7.4, the special projects, which is to provide for special departmentally managed intervention projects in the education system as a whole. I just wanted to get a sense as to what special projects were funded in the past two financial years, and then whether the department would be willing to support a proposal for a portion of this budget to be utilized to recruit mathematics and physics tutors to be placed at those schools where they've identified there's a poor pass rate in these particular subjects. Then, Chair, um, you can stop me if I need to go to another round for it, uh, Chair. Yeah, you can. Yeah, two, because I've just got yeah three quick ones, but I'll do it in the next. Yeah, if there is a... Yeah. <laughs> No, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, my my first question, I think uh, Member Christians has, part, uh, has, has partly covered the question, and, and I, I also want to understand in that uh, if we can get the update in the migration uh, of this ECD program from your DSD to um, education and, and, and perhaps what elements of that early childhood development would remain with the uh, uh, DSD, if 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 any, uh, the the other question, uh, chair, is on one 
88. Um, I think the questions around, because I'm, I'm looking at the outcomes as, as, as per the strategic plan. The questions around the fences, I think they've been exhausted. But what I, I, I want to understand is, is in terms of your school safety, uh, what budget uh, 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 do we have for that? And, 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 and perhaps the details of the programs that are, are, are funded. And in terms of how, how uh, uh, we deal with this issue of school safety, I just want to get an understanding if is, is, is education perhaps represented in your provincial um, uh, joints uh, committee, you know, around the issues of community safety? And in that uh, school uh, safety priority committee, uh, uh, what is the representation of the department? And what programs uh, 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 are adopted around this? Because I think there's too much that we can do uh, and uh, what uh, member Khalid likes, which is uh, fencing. Uh, and, and how often does this, it, well, sometimes we create these committees, but you find that they don't really uh, 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 sit and, and they work. Thanks, Chair. Yes, wonderful hearing everyone's different specializations. Member <laughs> Allen? Thank you so much, Chairperson. I have one quick question um, in terms of payments um, to CETA, um, which is obviously to provide um, human resource development. I'm glad to note in the APP that um, over the last um, few years that that amount has been increasing and it will continue to increase over the outer years. But I just wanted to get an understanding of the, um, do we have an idea of the amount of teachers um, that have benefited um, from this particular um, human resource development, or is that earmarked for everyone with that amount? Or is there a process to apply uh, via the district um, as a teacher if there's upskilling or human resources identify certain programs or training that would be appropriate? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my first two questions are relating to ECD as well. Sorry, to send me that in. Oh, ECD as well. The first is on page um, 193. Um, so in the reconciliation of the structural change of ECD moving over, so obviously the grade R in public schools is moving over to grade R, the early child development centers, the exact same amount is moving over. When you count up the human resource development and the training, it's moving over. Um, and I see obviously conditional grants increasing, but thereby pre-grade R in early childhood development center in table 10.3 is about 200 million rand difference. And I just want to find out, is that grant related or are you adding more money towards ECD? Um, it's just, I'm because the amount allocated for in education is about 400 million more than where it came from in total. Um, and then similarly, underneath the infrastructure development, for example, previously there wasn't an amount under infrastructure development for ECD, but now with the move over, there's about 13 million. So if you can just give us a little bit of clarity, uh, because my understanding was, okay, maybe you're just changing bank accounts, essentially, you know, and, and the program is moving over, but clearly there's about extra money there as well. And then my second question is just more uh, procedural, trying to understand how does one register an ECD? So if Deirdre from a community had to come to you and be like, I have the skills to run my own ECD, I, I want to do it, I don't know, out of my garage or turn my garage into an ECD or something, what, what would the requirements be for Deirdre to say, okay, I can register to be an ECD? Thank you. Minister? Thank you, Chairperson. I think I'm going to leave all of those to the SGN team. Thank you. They're quite technical in nature. Thank you, Chair. Problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, so maybe just to, we obviously we're going to share the questions. Mr. Eli, there's a portion there, especially on the budget stuff that needs to be answered. Mr. Cronia. 
there's also a, a question between you, I think, and Mr. Mohammed, if you could answer that, and then Mr. Mayer as well, but maybe just on, uh, and Mr. Abrams is a question on infrastructure. You can just cover that, please. But maybe just on the ECD coming over on the first question, uh, you know, and what was the purpose of this? Because uh, I think this, you know, what's the why? <laughs> this comes from the testing of children once they're in school and then you find that actually they can't read right so you start tracing this back and when you speak to foundation based teachers they will tell you the children aren't school ready whatever this means i'm not an expert in that area but they're not school ready so the idea of ect coming to the education sector is to infuse it with what this term school readiness means so that they are then able in grade one and grade two, maybe a little bit in grade R, but mainly in grade one and grade two, to start to develop the skills for learning, reading, writing, and calculating, which is the three things. So that's why it was that's why it was brought over chairperson. So the education sector, we know in DSD, the major issue for ECD is a safety issue. They keep children safe, keep them out of trouble, they keep them fed, and so on. That's the main Trust. They do a lot of other things also that help children, but the reason it came to education is they're saying that is sufficient. Sorry, that's necessary, but not sufficient. We actually want you to come with something more. So we've got a small team of people on my side who has who are fused with uh, people in on DSD. So we've got like a team of uh, four, I think three or four uh, colleagues can correct me, but DSD has 60 people working on ECD. Things the same for two years is to go on a journey of understanding about okay, so what are the gaps? What are the gaps that actually need to be plugged um, inside the system? It's going to present many challenges to us as a department chairperson. The modality of the way that operates is very different to our system. Our system is a highly structured system very defined, extremely defined. The ECD uh, centers, we have some that are centers in homes, we have some that are, it's just varied and different. And we need to try to get an understanding uh, of that and then start to make a decision about what we infuse from a play point of view, okay, that makes children ready, ready for school. A lot of the, the issues in relation to children not being ready is that the gross motor skills and the fine motor skills have not been adequately developed to allow a platform for learning to take place. So while we're not experts, is none of us here that are foundation phase experts. We're relying on our people at the bottom and that's what our people tell us. This is a, this is a situation. So I think you'll have to maybe call us from time to time to give you an update on, okay, so how's it going? You know, what has happened so far? For now, it's been a very technical engagement. We speak about staff movement. How's the budget going to come over? Where are they going to sit? You know, what? Are we not going to change the boundaries? Are the boundaries are mixing with our boundaries? What are those types of levels? Uh, labor relations issues, uh, negotiation with unions on labor, stuff like that. It's been at that level. I think we have to codify with our colleagues that are coming over on 1 April to say that we were doing this in this way. We see the change in relation to uh, how we're going to operate. Um, definitely inside the sector to have children in school ready. But here is a point I do want to make, which maybe the committee can assist us with. We've got ECD, we've got grade R, and we've got grade one. These are different things. <laughs> okay. Um, ECD is grade R or down, although some debate about it, but let's assume it's grade R or down. We're going to take our decision as a department. Here's our decision. In order to integrate R, you must turn six in a year. You may think this is a simple decision, not a simple decision. There are children under age sitting in grade R at the moment because of need. You know, community needs children are running around at home and they need to be put in. But if we want to get control over the system, we have to make a hard decision. The hard decisions we have to make is number one, for a child to integrate R, they must be turning six in that year. For a child to integrate one, they must be turning seven inside that year. Then to stick to that, it's going to be hard because you will all be lobbied for exceptions. 
and you will be coming to us as a department to say, can there be an exception? The department has to work out how to deal with the exceptions because there will be children that, you know, at six years old, they can actually be in grade two, <laughs> but they rare. Those examples are rare. And then we'll have to pull that out, Chairperson. We'll have to pull that out. Um, but to get control, strict rule on grade one and strict rule on grade um, R, and then we build backwards in grade R, R will be when you turn five and then ECD at the, at the lower levels. I think that's one, one thing that I just maybe just wanted to say. Experts in this area talk about the early grade reading assessment. You know, can learners be taught reading? We have to ramp that up, whatever that means, uh, for people who do this. So that, that's going to be another thing that we will have to look at, I think, as a, on the journey. ECD. I, I do believe that we'll see system improvements over time. I think systemically we'll see it. We'll see it over time. We won't, maybe we won't see it in year one or two, but I think we'll see it over time and you'll see that there'll be, be this thing. Of course, what it, the pressure it puts on us is that the demand for our services will now increase. Because you know, what's going to happen is we've got grade one, which is a compulsory grade. At this point, grade R is not a compulsory grade. But there will be pressure. At some point, it will be made a compulsory grade. Right? So then, that, in other words, we must we must see how we accommodate that. And then, as parents start to find out, well, there are all these options for me in the ECD space, more pressure. Now. So, I would just ask committees intelligent at this point. It's probably just too early to to give you the answers you want to hear. Yeah, uh, we have to co-create the answers with the other department, the colleagues that are coming over. Um, we have had chairperson. One long session of senior management with them, but there have been many sessions with them between the officials involved. But myself, I've had a long session with them, uh, speaking with them, listening to uh, you know the issues. Because now it's also about making sure that they feel part of the WCD family, um, and you know to under the understanding as to why why we're brought over. I think the one good thing for us, there's a lot of good things that are going to come. One of the good things are that they have a social worker. Um, focus. That's something that can we can we can use to strengthen our own muscle um, as a department in relation to that. But we'd we'll like to see how that how that works out. I think the other just a little caveat that I want to just add: the depart our department is not used to working with NGOs, Jeffers, okay. WCD. Mm. It's not a it's not a memory muscle that we have in our team. Okay, so we'll have to develop that and then rely on. I mean, we work with highly structured environments. NGOs is not highly structured. There are some that are highly structured, many are not highly structured. So we have to learn to, to how we work with that. I think the good thing in ECD is many of the smaller ECD centers belong to one uh, massive um, organization whose name is Cape Town, something came from South African ECD organization, something like that. They belong to one one big one uh, in DSD, through DSD. It also help us with the process. but. I think the key uh, is to talk to the people who are working inside the sector, have them alongside us, and help to both us. That's for the benefit of our children. That can only be for the benefit of our children um, over time. Okay, so that's just on that thing. I just wanted to mention that point. And then I think if the infrastructure question um, can be answered by, um, that was asked about infrastructure. Mr. Sayer, I just I want to just say some of the questions you're asking is actually about the annual report. They're not really about the APP. Mm. Um, I'm just mentioning it, but we will indulge the question. <laughs> I'll try and answer you, but I just want to make that point. Because <laughs> you're asking us about performance, uh, uh, but that's looking back. We, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Mr. 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 If you can, Mr. Evans, please. Um, and then, uh, Mr. Eli, special project 7.4. You can please deal with that. Um, school safety, Mr. Mayor. Would you be able to talk about that? Uh, because you also chairing committee there. And I know we represent it on all um, platforms, so you can maybe just talk about that on all the platforms in terms of school safety. We can talk about that. Uh, the question of Mr. Allen, who's going to answer that? The one about the payments. Thank you very much. And then here's a question. Will somebody please put up your hand? <laughs> How does one register in ECD? Does anybody know the answer to that? Or should we defer it for a written answer to the committee if we don't have it here, Chairperson? We'll find it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know that ECD people aren't in the room with us here. OK, we'll see if we can answer that. So if you can, I'm going to look here now, but if the others can answer questions, please, maybe sort them statements. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Stravici. The 46 referred to are the commitments we made to build classrooms at schools across October, this November, December, January. Those 46 have now been delivered. And the two schools that we had uh, communicated, Portasa High School, or for the name still to be registered and confirmed, and for Santa Kral number two, those two high schools um, will be ready for opening up at the start of the second term, so the first week of April. And so we'll work with the districts on all the other logistics to make that uh, to make that possible. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just around the um, question on page 190 around the special projects. Uh, in that special project uh, category, there were there were two projects we funded for the past two years. The the one is the Residential uh, Employment Youth Initiative, which is still running at the moment, and that's going to continue until 2023. And in part of the other funding in that category is actually our e-learning um, our e-learning uh, initiative, which we've been running also for quite a number of years as well, which is also part of that category uh, in that program 7.4. Then uh, there was a there was a question around the budget for safe schools. Uh, the budget for safe schools for the financial year 2022-2023 is 39.8 million rand. I think Mr. Mayer probably will respond about the programs they're running there, but that's the budget for 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 for, for safe schools. Then, uh, Chairperson, you asked a question around the ECD, the structural uh, because there's not structural changes. Um, Obviously, the reason why they've put it in there is to just for transparency's sake, because what they've done in program five, they've also adjusted the, the previous, the prior years. So you can't really see the change. So that's why they put this table in here. So if I can just start overall to say to you that um, the funding that's been shifted uh, from DSD to us. I'm just giving you overall totals so that we can then break it down into those various categories here. For 2022, 2023 financial year, we, we received about 386 million rand, uh, including there is a reduction in, in the conditional grant, about 5.8 uh, million rand. Then for the financial year 2023, 2024, we received uh, a funding of about 403 million rand, and the following year, 421 million rand. So, so when you go to these um, the structural reconciliation, you will see um, if you look at the the table below on your right hand side, you will see there's uh, pre grade R in ECD uh, childhood development centres. There's an amount of 289 million rand that we received. That's new. Uh, there was also a portion on the conditional grants as well. And that, that, that difference will be between the 7.3 in the prior in, in a um, sorry between what the original funding was. And in this 89, so there's about a uh, 82 million difference there in terms of the conditional grant. And then way at the bottom, you also see the on the infrastructure development, you will see early child development. You will see there's also a decent amount of 13.3 million rand, and that lies uh, in particular various programs. So the 13.3 lies in program six, which is infrastructure, and then the other portion lies in program five. So that's how it's been split, split up in terms of programs. But that. Chairperson is just a general overview of in terms of the funding that we received and then also in terms of breakdown of how that's gone into the various programs. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, in terms of uh, safe schools, as indicated by my, Mr. Eli, there are various programs within the safe schools component. Um, for example, we do target hardening. In other words, we look at uh, security gates and, and fencing. Um, emergency fencing for, for, for schools as well, uh, alarm systems, linking it to, to alarm companies or response companies, et cetera, in order to secure our facilities. We also do a lot of work via our call center for, for, for safe schools, where parents or learners or community members can call in any incidents that are happening at schools to report that through to us for actioning uh, by our staff in the various districts. <clears throat> we also run holiday programs for learners um, facilitated by our safe schools field workers, where they take learners at a particular school, provide lunches, et cetera, and engage in a variety of sporting activity as well as cultural activities um, at, at those particular sites. So, so that happens during school holidays. We also provide holiday security for, for schools in high risk areas, where we pay schools an additional amount in terms of a cluster 
the cluster then makes funds available to individual schools uh, for, for that security. Where we find a significant breach in the security at a particular school, we put in normally additional security where we pay for, for a period of 10 days, normally um, to have two uh, security guards during the day and two at night to ensure the security of the venue um, at, at the school. Then the, the question broader spoke to issues of, of uh, safety within the province. I am the chairperson of the Provincial Joints Committee on School Safety. Um, I'm also represented on the provincial joints meeting um, with the with the provincial commissioner. Uh, all the departments, relevant departments, are part of the school safety committee. For example, DSD is part of it. So is um, DOCS as well, as well as SAPS, uh, City of Cape Town, Metro Police and Law Enforcement. Um, intelligence community is also part of, of our meetings and we meet on a monthly basis. Um, that is just an indication of, of what we're doing at the Prof Joints level. We are also engaged in the ABTs. So all our safe school components in the various districts are in some way or the other involved with an ABT within their particular district. So in some districts, they spread over Atlantis, for example, and, uh, and Bishop Lavis. We've got two AD ABTs in that area. So the district north supports both of those ABT um, areas within, within, the, within their district as well. Um, we have also have a, a, a new program that we are still looking at uh, regarding violence prevention within the classrooms. Um, and I'm sure as that project starts taking off a bit more, we will be able to report on a bit more detail regarding that. The chairperson, just the offer again, um, if there is a requirement for a specific presentation on safe schools, um, to the committee, I see there's some new members. Um, I think it may be beneficial if we if we get that opportunity or request to do so. Thank you. Chair, just with regard to the question on HRD in the ECD space, uh, the driving force behind the increases is uh, basically by through the universalization of grade R. And um, that is provision of bursaries and subsidies to increase or towards qualifications of those practitioners uh, in, on that specific level. And uh, there are uh, existing agreements with our higher education institutions that um, uh, we have partnered with. The exact number of beneficiaries that we can provide afterwards, um, that's not um, at hand at the moment. Chairperson, if I could just end off and hand back to you. So maybe just to say on the, um, <clears throat> I can just give you the criteria that will be used in the application process, but I think we still would probably need to indicate exactly what the process is, but on information that we have in, at hand that uh, to be, to get to an ECD center, do you apply to be registered? Things that they consider to be the size, the safety, the feeding, the ratio of adult to learner, learner ratios, the toilets, uh, the application is then evaluated and obviously DSD would be used to doing that. So they, they have a memory muscle that's used to doing that and then there's conditional approval and then obviously there's a process of inspections and so on that follow it. And I think what I would suggest, Chairperson, is that just like the, that offer was made about school safety, when we call us back to come to a presentation on ECD with the colleagues who are actually running ECD. That would be my suggestion. Thank you so much, and and I do appreciate the receiving the factors for how an ECD is registered, but I think what a lot of people sometimes on the ground, they come to a member of parliament, they said, okay, but how do I register? It's like we take into consideration those factors, but which email do I email or which website do I use? Where do I log on? You know, where do I drop off my documentation? Um, and that's the type of information that I'm really looking for. So, so I'm going to take you up on that ECD. Um, uh, uh, briefing and so on as well as I think the members would probably appreciate the safe schools briefing as well. I just want to mention I know you said that your delivery statistics for classrooms and schools aren't currently available now but that you'll submit it in writing but you have submitted it in writing in the overview of the provincial and uh, municipal infrastructure book on page 55 under table 2.8 for the past three financial years and it is also on pages 79 and 80 of your new APP. So 
just wanting to let you know it is there but you're welcome to send it again if you would like some extra homework okay colleagues follow-up questions I saw member Syed's hand. Chair, no, I just want to give over my time for follow-up questions. I need to give some more space to the public. So I'm going to <laughs> withdraw my follow-up questions. Thank, Thank you. you for being so generous, member Christians. Yeah, just just a comment, and I know what the HRD said, it's a, you know, learning from him, but maybe on the later stage we can see, you know, because I would like uh, the ECD to benefit uh, when it comes to school applications and readiness as the HO. So that was my question all about, you know, how you're going to link the two to benefit the education system. But we can do, a, a, you know, a, a resolution on that and maybe at a later stage uh, have something in that regard. Thank you, Chair. No, I completely agree. And I think something like the ECD, especially as to how we're going to monitor infrastructure now that um, uh, the the instruction note 16B is being amended, I think we're going to have to do much more closer oversight in terms of trying to understand how, how that's going to work. But colleagues, if there are no follow-up questions, I'm so excited because now we're essentially just on the lectures. Page 195 until 213. Are there any questions? 195 until 213. That's until the end of the vote. And that's basically just the lectures. Any questions? Going once, going twice. I only have one question on page 202. So I understand that the lectures for provincial payments and estimates are broken up to the respective municipalities. And um, I just wanted to understand how to interpret the respective table. Is it you are spending the money in that municipality? or that money is being spent on educational programs and infrastructure within that municipality. Um, because at the moment, it kind of reads a little bit as if, um, as if the money is simply spent in the area compared to the respective programs. And then obviously, when you go into the programs on pages 203, 204, 205, 6, 7, and so on, then it goes by vote. Um, but obviously, instead of them referring to the program, the money is then spent on in that area, just says, for example, George. So if I could just get a little bit of um, assistance on how I should be interpreting those respective tables. Thank you. Um, Chairperson, uh, this annexure is, is a formally driven exercise by provincial treasury, which they give to us and then we populate it accordingly. So you will see that this actually ties up to our entire vote. So it's um, obviously it's there, there are particular formulas that they use to get to those particular figures in terms of the percentages. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we, we, we get to those things. It's not necessarily uh, what you're referring to. I think these are just kind of guesstimates. So, for example, if you're building two schools in George, then the amount will be in the George one in that particular area. OK, that's just, that's all I wanted to know is how do I interpret that? Thank you so much. If there are no other questions, if members are OK, I would like to open up to the public now. OK, thank you so much. I see four members of the public with us in person, and I think there are some members online as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take hands from the public in the house first. And then I'm going to take hands from the public online on the digital platform. Um, I see, I think it's Ms. LaRue at the back. Um, sorry, Ms. Mobomop? Is that your surname? Sorry. Um, let me see. Apologies. What I'm going to ask is just, uh, we have like a list of five people's surnames with some, now I'm playing a guessing game. If you can just introduce yourself again for the record and just so you can ask your respective questions um, in that order. Thanks. Ms. LaRue? We can start from the left, Ms. Luru, the hand okay. up first, and then we'll go to the right. Thanks, Jay, and um, good day to the committee, and thanks for the opportunity. I'm Vanessa Leru. I'm from, a, from an organization called Parents for Equal Education South Africa. Jay, um, there's just a few things, a few points that I need to address if I'm listening to, to the presentation that the WCD made. And I think from we, we should start from the beginning. As activists and organizations, and, and I'm hearing what the presenter said, that they are not used to working with NGOs and that, that type of stuff. That doesn't mean the whole department doesn't 
is not used to working with NGOs. But but what I found over the years, she is that there's a there's a deliberate exclusion. If they don't want to hear us, they mute us. Um, if they don't want to engage us, they don't. And at the end of the day, if the public is important to them, they will listen to us. We we have a problem where public servants don't know the code of conduct anymore. They expect of us as activists to bow down to them. If we question them and hold them accountable, they perceive that as some type of form of disrespect. And, and I think this needs to stop because at the end of the day, we as public know what the term public servants mean. These people, these officials that we pay with our taxpayer money, they expect us to roll out the red carpet for them, which is not right. They have no issue ignoring us. The MEC, and, and I understand that she's a political appointment, but at the end of the day, she availed herself to work with the public. These people are going head, at, head to head with us in public spaces when we address critical issues, Chair. And that can't be right. If we, if they don't know or value the, the public anymore, then we are in deep trouble. If they don't value, if they don't uphold Batu Pile anymore, then we are in trouble. Those phones that they block us on when we try to hold them accountable for what they should give to us. That's our money that pays that phones. They have an attitude, the MEC, even the HOD, they came into the, that seat the other day. You have an attitude. As long as I don't curse you as a public servant, you will deal with my frustration because ultimately that's the frustration of my community. And you availed yourself for this position. Why does public servants expect us to bow down to them? That's and, and that relation, and I, and I think the committee should hold them accountable for the code of conduct that they give us to, <clears throat> to us as the public, because they are making us off as politicians, whatever. In the meantime, they are sitting with our resources, and we must create an equal society, an equal education system that's accessible for especially poor people. Then they come in with their personalities and they expect us to engage their personalities. We, they are working for us, we're not working for them, Chair. Then the other thing, Chair, that I want to address with the committee, and, and we as activists, we really want to call on the committee to take our hands in holding these people accountable for, for the services that they need to give to us. Because I don't know if the committee realize that we are in a deep, deep crisis in education in the province, irrespective of what type of uh, picture they want to portray to the world out there. Che, imagine one teacher sitting with up to 80 children in one class in a foundation phase. Then, then I'm asking myself, when is the community? We are, we are always reacting to the crisis. That's why the WCD don't find it as a priority to build schools. We are creating squatter schools now. Just like we, they are creating squatter camps in the Western Cape, they are creating squatter schools. You should, you should really go to these schools in our community, not the ones that they picked out prior to school visits. You must go to these schools. Go to Forest Heights, it's look, it really looks like a squatter camp because what they do as an alternative, because they don't want to build schools, they are putting up all of these mobile classes. And I'm asking, where is the Department of Public, of Public Works in all of this? Because a school is designed to take a certain amount of children. Anything over that, it's a health risk. It's a safety risk. Why are we allowing these squatters the, this, uh, this department to treat our people and our children like squatters. Go and look at all of these mobile classes. That's their solution to not building schools for our children. Because at the end of the day, each and every year, we sit with this problem of unplaced learners. I'm still asking, Chi, how many learners are not placed yet in the province? They they won't answer that question. And, 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 and the one member of the committee raised the concern of dropouts 
members, our children are not dropouts. They don't provide education for our children. Each and every year they don't, thousands of children are not in a school, not because they don't want to, because they are not providing schools for our children. You need to re really revisit what you count as dropout because our children are not dropouts. Each and every day I still have countless complaints of parents with children not in a school. That these parents want their children in a school. How do you ignore us as the biggest stakeholder? We are the biggest stakeholder in this in this whole department. The MEC chose choose when and how she wants to un, answer our, our issues. The, the, the HOD also chose that path now. He choose when and how he wants to. But you know when when they play for the gallery, they make it a Vanessa, Vanessa issue. So, um, uh, this I must tell to the committee. And I, I want to address the committee and say my child is sorted. Is he receiving the best education? And what he received, I want for each and every child in this community because they deserve it. That's our only tool out of our circumstances. Why are you not holding these people accountable? Why are you comfortable with them putting up slides and not come and ask us as activists that's in the community whether these people are telling the truth? Most of the time, these slides, is a, it's a lot of... Uh, gimmick that they put together. It's far from the reality that we live in. I'm asking why is the committee not taking our hands in this? Let me tell you, they, we, we are sitting with a problem of overcrowded classrooms where teachers are struggling. They are burdening our teachers with administration. With administration. Our teachers are falling apart and so is our children. They, they struggle to employ teachers in our communities. Last year, we had an issue in Otsuara. I'm, I'm originally from Otsuara. I, uh, the, the parents contacted me because this principal from a form of moral C school, which happens to be a white principal, he didn't want to take the, the 14 English children because his remarks is these children are a problem. This parents wrote to the MEC, uh, her response was, these children must go to other schools. I don't know how she knows Otsuran, but quite frankly, she sent these children back to the location because they don't need to go to a former Moral C school. And I said to, 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 to the HOD, if you want to send our children back to the, to the location, it's not going to be an easy trip. Guess what? In a space of a week, they gave that school a teacher to accommodate these children where our schools are struggling for months and years to get additional teachers in overcrowded classrooms. In a space of a week, they gave this white school a teacher that they didn't budget for. I'm asking, what, where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? Because they didn't shut me up. They didn't, they, they will never shut me up if they think that's what they wanted, that's, that was the agenda. That's where I saw the inequalities in it all. They don't well, both. Dude, I'm going to ask that we just um, wrap up because we do have at least another four members of the public in the house that would also like to ask questions. Um, I do note some of the questions you've um, asked are general, not necessarily linked to this particular budget. However, I'm going to ask that the department just please assist you quite briefly also with those answers. But I would also like to take the questions from the, from the public that is currently in the house as well. So if you can maybe just round up with the last sentence, um, please, thanks. The, then, uh, thank you. Then the, the matter of the special needs schools. Um, there is no accountability in the special needs schools. We are asking at this point, why don't they build special needs schools? Because at the end of the day, we are sitting in mainstream schools with children that needs to be in special needs schools, but they are in, on waiting lists for years and years, and the department hope they reach the age of 15 so that they don't have to be responsible for them. And our teachers are not trained to deal with these issues. That's why even the autism spectrum, why is these children still in a mainstream school? Why are they not speeding up whatever 
service needs to be done to these children. Because at the end of the day, that's where the discipline problems in our school starts. And I think it's a deliberate process to make our schools fall apart, makes our teachers fall apart, and they are placing our teachers and other learners in danger. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. I'm now going to allow the, the members of the house. I apologize, I got your surname wrong earlier. It was Miss Nelson, right? Miss Nelson, thank you. Okay, so from left to right, um, if we can just keep, I know I'm um, being a little bit unfair to keep your questions uh, quite brief, but just so we can get through all of the questions so that the department is able to have sufficient time to answer each and uh, every one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. So my name is Vanessa Nelson. I represent an organization called Hope for the Future. This is my T-shirt. And we stand for our motto is Educate, Eradicate, Eliminate. I'm here representing children who suffer with learning disabilities. I see in, the, in this, um, on here it says it speaks of intellectual disabilities. So I had a son who was diagnosed with ADD at, at the age of six and ADHD at the age of eight. <clears throat> He's turning 30 in October. Thank God he finished his school. As an activist on the ground, I stood up and fought for my child. 15 years down the line, I find the same current system in place. The, w, uh, um, the education curriculum, um, it says so beautifully on this first page or 165, quality education for every child in every classroom, in every school in the province. And that is a blatant lie. It does not include children who suffer with learning disabilities. ADD, ADHD, autism, children of dyslexia and so on. So it's not an inclusive uh, um, curriculum currently serving the entire province. Um, and in the mission, the mission speaks of every child has quality learning opportunities, which is far from the truth. Your mission is a direct violation of all of our children who suffers with learning disabilities. It's, they've got their human right is to have equal quality education. For children who suffers with learning disabilities, it's never been so. Since my son has left school, I had the opportunity uh, in my working environment I was able to phone around, or even I talk about back then, Mr. Enver Hassan was that time the principal, and I dealt with him directly. I refused to deal with Mr. Johnson, who was at Adafel Primary, because they were failing my son. And when I, and he was in grade four. Um, um, one of the members spoke about the dropouts. Um, two, people, two of the members spoke about Mr. Walters, and uh, one of the members uh, um, of Algema spoke about dropouts. And, and the, the, it's not factual information that you're giving. I'm telling you, I'm on the ground in my community in Aydafel. And the reason for the dropout, it's not because of uh, um, the children. Uh, even there's overcrowding, yes. But I'm going to tell you the direct reason for dropouts in our, in, our, in our schools is the system, the current system is not made for children with learning disabilities. So the children remain in the mainstream. And that is, we find that children in grade 10 on high school cannot read, cannot write. So what happens in the, in the, in the foundation phase, the investment for WECD is to invest in the foundation phase. Because once the child reaches 14 and once the child reaches grade 4, they lost in the system. Somebody needs to take accountability for all the children that are sitting on the corners. That is why we, us on the K-flat will remain there because the system has been made for us, our children to remain there. The child repeats a grade. At grade two, it's been picked up. The child has got a learning disability. Not necessarily that the child cannot finish in the mainstream because of overcrowding. But once the child has been picked up, and I'm going to use my son and three other children that I've currently got as clients, two are sitting in grade 10, Haida Falai, Kafka and I, and the other one is in grade eight. So all three of them has been just passed on in the system that is made now. The system is made for only children that is, who is academically sound. So your policy says here on page 181, policy development, it says none. I know uh, Mr. Mohammed, we met from the WECD. We met with the special needs board of directors. We were three 
that rep represented our organization. We had a very good meeting. And in our meeting, when we met, you mentioned 62 schools where there's a pilot project in place over the last two years. I find that ironically, over the two years during COVID, you've implemented a program to uh, assist children with learning disabilities. It's not been identified where this 52 has been, um, uh, um, where, it's, where it's happening right now. You need to come on the ground and the, 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 the uh, member of the public that spoke now, we are on the ground, come talk to us. We will tell you where the problem is. But another problem that I have and that I found out, about seven learners over the last month, their they, 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 they marks in the progress report speaks of sixes and sevens in grade seven. And when they came to grade eight and grade nine and grade 10 on high school, they're not even on two. Because we are now, we now know that the system has been doctored. And I think the, the, all of you, all of you members are sitting here have now so uh, um, profoundly reported in terms of what the statistic is, but what you are giving us is all lies. It's fabricated lies. Because a teacher came forward at one of my schools in, in the area whereby she needs to, she is being told what button to press. If that child is in English, he's on a level three. And then she are being told she must put in a five or a six. So the system has been doctored because it's about the schools and in um, they need to have a, a, a they're painting, painting a rosy picture, but that's not the case. The case is that the system has been lying to all of us. And one of our meetings, I mentioned that the system, the progress reports is for, for the mommy. And I didn't have the opportunity to finish it. Because what they tell me when my child comes home is, no, your child doesn't have a problem because look at his progress report. But then when I sit with my child, my child cannot even read. My child does not even know these vowels. And so I'm asking the question, the budget here speaks on page, I've actually written page 174 um, on program point four, program four about the grant the learners with prone, profound intellectual disabilities. How is that money going to be spent? Because we already have children now in the current foundation phase who's lost in the system. And I speak about seven primary schools in my area. Willows Primary, um, Dagbrek Primary, Heidefall Primary, Woodlands Primary, St. Teresa's Primary, Welcome Primary, Vanguard Primary. I've got children, parents who's been, who came forward at each of that primary schools and is no joke. There's, a, there's, there's money being set aside for that. How is that money going to be actually spent? And other than we're not told that there is a pilot project. In my area, that pilot project is not happening in my area, and I'm here speaking for my area. However, we've got champions in our other areas. Two moms from Mitchell's Plain that came forward. Uh, one child was, was diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, in Mr. Mr. Ham Muhammad can say, one of his directors reported that there's a, a, a certain pain for a child who's dyslexic, but the school never made an application for that child to receive that pen. The mom had to spend 5,000 rand saving to buy that do her daughter a pen. She currently have removed the daughter two years out of the system. Then we speak about the infrastructure. How much of this infrastructure budget is going to spend on what we need, on what the children who suffers with intellectual like you're saying or learning disabilities as we call it there is a ratio in terms of schools of skills and special needs schools is simply not enough but that cannot be the last resort my son finished school even though he was adhd and we find that when the district psychologists in terms of the ratio of schools that they serve they never get to all of their schools not even in the space of two years a child, a child that I had in 2017 is sitting on high school now, my neighbor's child. A mom and I, we grew up together. She's on in grade uh, um, eight now on high school. The teachers identified in grade two that she's got a problem. She's ADD. The district psychologist assessed her. I've got a file in my office. I met with, with Mr. Desai of Adafal Primary in 2017, even in 2018. That child was assessed. When I got on board for two years, the district psychologist never sent the report of that learner. And what happened was 
she passed the age of 14 to be transferred to a school of skills because the cutoff age is 14. So what happened was she's been passed on the system and there's, there, there is a, a, a current pattern. You can go to any school. Grade two, they will repeat. Grade three, they pass. Grade four, they will remain two years. And eventually the child gets passed, lost in the system. So the WEC do must take this money and spend it on the children who suffers with learning disabilities because they are our gangsters. They are our drug addicts. They are our merchants and they are the moms who gives birth to every, every other year to another child. The dropout is not because of them uh, uh, um, wanting to say it. No, I beg to disagree, Mr. Walters. They, you say that there must be consistency. What consistency do you allow a child who cannot absorb what the current curriculum is giving him or giving her? Because the curriculum is made for children who's academically sound. So the percentage of the children who remains in that grades who cannot absorb like a sponge, a normal sponge that absorbs water, what happens to that child? That child gets passed on, on into the system and then they like, says the, 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 the lady before this also speak behavioral issues because the child then stand up for himself eventually. So the report from primary school that goes to high school, what do they look at? That child was a problem in primary school. I have a child who's out of school for three years, just started grade eight. Yet went from eight of our primary to Kathkin High because he said the word K and he was suspended. He said he didn't say so. He had witnesses. Whether he said so or not, that's irrelevant. He wasn't given or afforded the opportunity to apologize and been given, put in a program to, because um, racial issues is always happening in our, in, our, in our school. This child is three years out of school. He was diagnosed with ADHD at Haidafal Primary. And you've heard me saying in Haidafal Primary so many times, a school where my son came from where the system still has not changed, has not been amended. So this current curriculum is not an inclusive curriculum. You are, you are living in some type of fantasy uh, um, world where you think that your current curriculum is there to provide for our children that suffers with learning disabilities. And I'm here to ask you, there is a lot of schools that needs infrastructure. The money must be spent on schools where, where special needs schools and schools of skills. In Mitchell's plan, there's 47 primary schools. Ms. Guess Nelson. how many uh, schools of skills is there? And Ms. how many Nelson, special needs schools ask is there? If you can just One of up. each. So I'm here, I, 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 I get very passionate, I'm frustrated. I because their human right has been violated. The Freedom Charter speaks of equal quality education. The constitution speaks of it. On your pages one, what's it, 167, all the acts is there, but this X on this paper being bring printed black and white means absolutely nothing for all of our children that suffers with learning disabilities. And I think I'm going to stop there, but I just want to urge you, you must put yourself in my shoes and the parent who's got a child who, who is, he suffers from a learning disability. Your children are okay. 80% of our children on the Cape flat is not okay. And we, I want to raise and support leaders. I don't want when I'm gone one day, I've done my bit, but when we still find we've not eradicated in terms of the dropouts, the gangsterism, the drug addicts, the merchants, the girl who keeps on having children because there's no alternative. An alternative must be made and it must be implemented. The sooner the better to save the children in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Um, I never like interrupting anyone um, from the public because you come here to specifically give us your input and, and thank you so much for being here. Ms. Mbombo, am I correct? Thank you very much. Uh, let, first of all, I would like to greet you all in the chamber. My name is Nolufefe Mbombo. I'm representing Vet Sand School Crisis Group. Actually, I stay in Atlantis in the area of its uh, I just want to raise a, a question about the school in the area. There is a school that was, is a, a temporal school that was built in 2021. But that school is not in its own land. That school is, is on a, 
on, on, on a school that is being, is being uh, um, next to the sewer, sewer drain, is not a proper school. We need a proper, when is the proper school going to be built for that particular area in that sun? Because that, that school is a temporal school and the land is listed for only 10 years. But my question is, that land is leased for 10 years, but each and every year is only one class added. That means it's going to fully operate only for six years. That is a wasteful expenditure. And the other, the other item for me is uh, the transport that is for the street, for the children that is going around the area of Atlantis. There is an area that is called Million of Primary School in Philadelphia. We got a lot of students that are attending in that area. We went there in two weeks back to, to the district to request for a transport in two weeks back. Remember, our children are writing exams. There were children that were left behind by the transport because the transport was not enough. When we went and got talked to the district manager that side, he she told us that he, there are documents that need to be signed, which is procurement, I don't know it. Now, we don't care about that. We care about the future of our children. Immediately, there is a, a number of the students that are attending a special school. I, I think the children were supposed to be uh, allocated with a transport that is going to, to, to lead them to the future, to, for, for, for their chief, for their future. I'm humbly requesting that they must speed up the transport for the students so that they can stop moving up and down in the location. All the students, the learners must be in school. This thing of the, of the Western Cape government, that is not, that doesn't care about the school, the building of our schools. I think it needs to stop before the community members can get fed up because all of our children, they need better education. There is another place in Atlanta that is called Mamri. Mamri is a long, it's a long, it, it was long established, long time, but there is not even one high school. In the whole of Atlantis, I can tell you now, we got 12 prime primary schools, but only four. What, what is the future of our children? Can we, hum, can you guys humble, humble, humble build, make sure that the, 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 the money is going to be spent to building the, the infrastructure of the school? Because I, what I know is this, when you, before you was there, you was here as the mini or the honorable ministers. You went to school, you went to and go study, and nobody violated your rights. It seems as if now Atlantis is being violated. The, the Atlantis learners, you can't have 12 primary schools and only four. And remember, the money that you are spending for the transport is supposed to be kept to build the schools. I'm humbly requesting that all the all the areas where if really my my my, my partner here, she's 100% correct. I uh, know not her, the other one that was online. She was 100% correct. If the land can be occupied by the Okies, how come that we can we can't build proper schools for our people so that they can we can have a better better societies. I'm also I'm also concerned about the pieces of land around inside the inside the premises of the schools. I found out some of these learners they don't eat in schools, ne? because of their certain criteria. But I'm humbly requesting that we can make agriculture fashionable in the schools. A little piece of land we can plant vegetables work together with the Department of Agriculture so that you can put something on the table for the school. Because some of the, of the learners, they go to school with a hungry stomach, but they eager for learning. Thank you very much. I'm not going to be long. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Beek, I'm not sure if you're speaking for both or if, you, if each is speaking individually. No, Dimo's out there, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Mr. Mkiz is going to, to speak for himself. My name is Imlande Limbik. Otherwise, I'm not going to take more than five minutes. I'm from the Nyanga Tourism Platform. I'm going to talk in regard to page 165, policy priorities in regard to safety. I think I was, I'll give you hypnosis. I was here in 2016 in this parliament. And we requested Nyanga. Nyanga at that time was um, a crime capital of the country. We came here, we requested 
the chairperson that was serving on the Standing Committee on Education to have an oversight. I think Ms. Musa can confirm that. The, the chair, that was the first time that somebody responded positively. I've been working nothing I regularly. Frank in this parliament for more than 20 years. That was the first time that a standing committee chair went to our township. My township was established in 1946. Safety, we requested that the resolution was taken that a Mr. Ellen Mayer to contact us, that was in 2017, was still waiting for him to contact us. What we wanted to know, the constitution of the committee that is leading, we even went to Mr. Morris, the head of the Department of Community Safety. He referred us to the Department of Education. We want to know the functionality of this committee. And the Nancy got, he is, what do you call this? A response mechanism. If somebody reports in a school something that's happening, for instance, gangsters, where do you go? Where do whom do you contact? We've been trying this. Secondly, we want these security companies to go out of our schools. Because at that time, when there are security companies, there's a lot of vandalism. What we have opted to do in our area, we have recruited a neighborhood watch. Neighborhood watch are better equipped to look after our schools and they are better positioned because they know the social dynamics of the area. If you can look on page 166 on paragraph 3, page 66 on paragraph 3, there's additional money that has been added to assist 18,000 learners that are always added in the system. This has been happening from 2016. 2016, they were 25. We asked the question, if they are going to be 18 members of the community that are going to be added in the system, are there any additional non teachers that are added to minimize the ratio of non student non ratio? Then we go to 174 on paragraph six. On program six, is this money going to include the, the dilapidated schools in our area? I've just said that my school has been established in 1946. Those schools were established in 1947 by the community. The only school that was built by the Department of Education in my area is Oscar Mpeta High School. The rest were just upgraded. Most of the schools in my area were built by the communities. Thank you, I'm not going to take too long. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Beek, I'm not sure is that you, if your mm. colleague would also like to say something. Is that Mr. Tsambula? Am I correct? Th th thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm not going to be long as well because most of the colleagues who have spoken mm. before me have touched upon many, uh, upon a number of areas that I was going to touch. Uh, mine is just to commend uh, the availability of 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 the uh, of the school uh, in in Nyanga, where a renovation was 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 made during the time when the school called Linge uh, applied for renovation, where you would replace replace the asbestos roofing with the corrugated iron, and that process was very went on very smooth. I commend the the department for that. However. According to the hall, which which was also which we proposed to be built, having looked at the package or the policy of the department where it requires our local schools, particularly those who do not have a multi-purpose hall, and the response from the department was to build uh, a hall, not a multi-purpose but an ordinary hall where we had a very serious questions uh, about the layout plan and the layout design, which was completely changed. We don't know how did that happen because the previous uh, building designer that we worked with, apparently it was known to be, you know, 
removed from the process. And the department appointed their own company, which for me was 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 very much um, problematic. Because as we speak right now, the hall that was built in Linke, it's only a hall, not a multi-purpose hall, which gives us a, a, a huge question mark. Because if you build a, a, a hall, uh, or a multi-purpose world, because we are proud of the, the facility itself, because in the past, in terms of the infrastructure and the allocation of sporting activity within the school, we are proud of the fact that that's, the Linga school has produced basketball, basketball players who happened in the, in, the, in, uh, in the past to be members, to play for the Western Cape basketball. So we are very much concerned about the manner in which our request is just being undermined. Uh, also, there's a last phase, last phase which we thought was going to be to be implemented regarding the extension or the, the the additional classrooms at the school. But that layout plan we don't know. The layout plan, the laid out the layout design has gone missing. But it's gone missing somewhere because uh, because the department perhaps maybe be uh, give us a direction of as to what had happened to the original layout plan. So I'm thank you, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, now ask between the minister and the department if you can just um, allocate those respective questions. One question was posed to the committee regarding the functions of the committee. So I'm just going to read that out for everyone quickly. It is in the Western Cape Provincial Parliament rule book as updated on March 2021. Um, it's rule number 91, which relates to the general powers of committees. I'm just going to read it out for us all quickly. In performing its functions with its prescribed mandate, a committee may, subject to the law and the rules and orders of the House, a exercise any power assigned to it by the Constitution, legislation, other rules or resolutions of the House, B, determine its own internal procedures in accordance with its annual program. C, conduct public hearings. D, summon any person to appear before it and produce documents. E, receive representations, including petitions. F, hear oral evidence. G, establish subcommittees. H, confer with other committees. And I, meet uh, when circumstances require in the province at a place or places beyond the seat of the provincial um, parliament. So that's just the general um, read out quickly because I know the question was posed. Um, it's also available on the respective website. Minister HID, I don't know who wants to go first. Yeah, I'll go first. I'll end Thank you, quick. Chairperson. I'll just start Minister. and then hand over to the HID, please. Thank you, yes. Um, I just want to um, thank the members for their inputs. We take note of many of the concerns that we are very aware of and have been trying to address for quite some time. Um, I am particularly concerned about the issue of the progression policy where learners are kept uh, in um, school and then pushed forward when they're not actually able to do the work. I completely agree that is an issue and it hasn't been, yes. um, there haven't been uh, enough remedial work uh, done in that respect because the intention is that yeah. they should be assisted when they go through to the next grade. And we do need to look at that and that's a big concern. Um, I also am concerned about the point made about teachers being forced to put marks up when they, when they aren't actually deserving. And I would very much like the member to please give me specifics of that uh, to my office. The details are on the website. And if not, then one of the members there could please assist her with my office email address. I would like to hear about it. But the other issues I think can be dealt with by the HOD and soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Maybe maybe just to say, uh, if I could start with Ms. Nelson. Uh, so thank you for your input, ma'am. Um, but I do note that, I just want to note for the record, the department did actually give Ms. Nelson a written reply on the 18th of Feb. And also Ms. Nelson actually met with officials of the department in um, inclusive education, uh, special schools, a detailed meeting with Ms. Daniels, Dr. Naika and others did take place. I think if there's still unhappiness, then I would suggest maybe Ms. Nelson, we elevate it. We can have a discussion. I'm prepared to meet with you uh, with uh, Dr. Naika and uh, Ms. Daniels in the room. So we can just get on the same page perhaps and just talk about this. I think maybe to say to your person, clearly we have to work according to a system. 
and to make sure that um, in the end we work to the best interest of the system as a whole. I'm just going to ask Mr. Mbika if you can just switch your mic off there at the back. <laughs> just a button. Mike. Mr. Mbiko. You yes. just press that. <laughs> Thank we you so to, much. So just to, to say to Ms. Nelson, I, I think the difficulty chairperson is that, you know, I think this the issue of like children moving up a grade and then being promoted. Right? I mean, in her case, Ms. Nelson's case is a real issue for her. Because now it negatively affected her child. It's a national policy in the whole system. In order to keep children moving through the system, they're only allowed to fail once in a phase. So generally what happens is they keep back at the first time they fail and then they have to be advanced. OK, um, so I'm just I'm just making that point. It doesn't detract from the seriousness of your personal situation, but the system sometimes doesn't work for everybody in terms of weight, weight. So I think just to make that offer that for Ms. Nelson, certainly to say that. So uh, to Ms. LaRue's comments, I did give Ms. LaRue the, uh, the assurance and we have been communicating for more than a year with Ms. LaRue. I personally communicated with Ms. LaRue directly on WhatsApp and other platforms. Um, so I have given her the assurance that every matter that she raises with the department and with me personally is looked into. She, for example, was the person that alerted me to the fact that schools in the Blue Dance area didn't have water. I acted on that and I did communicate that with Mr. Rue. So I think the issue, Chairperson, is that yes, we try and be as responsive as we can. The MEC, myself, the team, as far as we can, the system is very large. And I don't know if we have an appreciation my larger system is. Um, when a million children in a, say so imagine a thousand schools assemblies, because we already been to school, we know what a school assembly is, a thousand school assemblies at the same time. So we have to move according to the system. That's not to detract from the issues that are raised, because I think some of these issues we appreciate it because it, it brings, it highlights the issue. But do I ever ask chairperson on the record that my officials please be retreated with respect? that they not be abused. Because essentially, to sit here and say that we are lying, why would I do that? That's not in my interest. I can be jailed if I lie, okay, to this committee. Not only about my job, but it could be a criminal offense. So if we made errors in terms of what we said, never to cover up anything, it's, that's the information we have on hand. I spoke about the absenteeism of students in the streets. That's not a lie. That's the stuff we got outside of the school. School tells us, listen here, um, we're supposed to have 1,000 children here. We got 900 today. We get that on a daily basis. Mr. Abrams is in charge of data for this department. He's got a sophisticated system of taking dipsticks over time. It's not lies. Not lies. These are the data facts. Now, if the allegation is that the input of the data at the school level is a lie, and a specific example can be given and that we will investigate. You mentioned one, for example, ma'am, about um, give the child a three and then, or child was supposed to get a three, but then someone give the child a five. We can look into that specifics, Chairperson. But I don't think we can just paint the whole department with a brush and say we're lying. I think that's unfair. So I would ask that if there are specific matters, that we just raise those specific matters um, with us. I think then maybe to move on to uh, Ms. Mabombo, if somebody could just perhaps um, look into some of the issues raised there. Ms. Mabombo represents a Whitland school group. She's asking about the Atlantis area. But I do want to say this, Ms. Mabombo, from a systemic point of view. We've got a problem. I'll say, I'll say what the problem is. Access to basic education in the history of South Africa. It wasn't as universal as it is right now in the history. So historically, what happened is as more and more people went into the education system, we service the primary schools first. So we've got a ratio of high schools to primary schools, 3.75 to 1. Do I have that statistic correct, Mr. Abrams? 3.75 to 1. So in other words, for every 3.75 um, primary schools, we've got one high school. Okay. So clearly there's going to be a funnel where you get the, the crowding to one point. So the 10, to 10, 10 primary schools to four high schools is fitting that statistic. 
it's the same kind of it's actually a little bit better so but it's but it's fitting fitting the statistic so what that means is it's a progressive realization chairperson of progressive realization of making sure we give more access over time we have spoken in this committee about blended online learning and the potential to address the statistic which Mr. Bombo actually presented to the committee yeah? um, to try and see if we can't take pressure off the system. The issue about whether we provide teachers when we actually do provide schools, the answer is a resounding yes. There's absolutely no way we'd be saying to a school, here's a mobile classroom, take 38 children, but we're not going to give you a teacher. Not only do we provide a teacher, ma'am, we also provide the learning support materials for that, the desk, the textbooks, the stationery, the whatever else that is required with that mobile to just be able. To, so I just wanted to perhaps uh, make that make that point. I think again, uh, offer to the department, one of the colleagues, uh, maybe just on the infrastructure side, can just take the details from Mr. Bowman and we we'll follow up with some of the some of the other issues um, that that were raised. Um, the issue, I think it was Mr. Mabeko who said about the teachers, uh, teacher ratio, but we do have a process called the basket of posts. Each year we sit with trade unions and we talk about potentially what we're going to insert into the system for the following year. There's a formal process for that chairperson. I engage with him and the MEC engages. They must agree on the number and that's the number that actually gets inserted into the system. I don't have the stat on the direct number for this year, but it's over a thousand posts, I think, on this budget that we're actually inserting um, into the system for next year. Um, I'm just in the last question was from Mr. Tambula, but it, it, it was more, I think, observation uh, that he had um, made uh, in, in various things. But I just want to say that um, you made negative and positive comments, Chairperson. So again, we maybe just have an offline with him before the, before the end to just follow up on the specifics. But this is what I do want to say. Finally. I mean, clearly we are public servants and we know what that means. You know, um, the experience here in this room is in decades. Um, and we understand that to serve people. We have to do that in a way that is respectful to us. That is very, very important. When we start talking about mental well-being and the wellness of people and the psychosocial support, that applies to us as well. We're also human beings. That applies to politicians and everyone else inside the system. So my appeal just to the to the public is let's um, dial down the temperature and let's have a conversation that's constructive and then put out these are actually our issues. The commitment I give from my team is that clearly we have a seriousness to try and address them. But here's a kicker. You won't always get the answer you came there for. In other words, the thing that you wanted to hear, perhaps you will not get that answer. What you will get is systemically what the organization is trying to do. And I think all I can ask is for an appreciation that we run an extremely large system with uh, lots of differences inside that system. And we've got to make sense of that on a daily basis. And so the commitment from uh, myself and my team here, uh, chairperson, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of the MEC, I mean, we are committed to making sure that quality education, the vision of it is realized. It is a vision because we know that in some spaces is an happening. That's why it remains a vision and it's something that we must strive for. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you so much. I know we have run over time, but I felt that it was necessary to use my discretion just to allow for, for all the input to be given and for the respective answers to be given as well. And I think um, just from my side, whether you're from the committee, whether you're from the public, whether you're an uh, official or a public servant within our departments and within our schools, um, it's so important for us all to work together on, on these respective problems. We're not going to solve them on our own. Um, and, and I do appreciate uh, the, the passion and determination of our community members and our parents also to make sure that that our children have that quality education that we envisioned for them. And I appreciate the work that the department and the teachers and the assistants in our schools are doing, because it's not always easy um, in, the, in, the current, in the current South Africa environment that we are in, with all the different pressures that children have been through. We've been through a global health pandemic. 
um, that we haven't seen the type of like, uh, you know, compared to other different centuries. And we also have to acknowledge the impact that has had on children and how traumatic that has been within communities as well. Colleagues, I am going to ask now that um, the particular um, concerns that members had that were more general, to be please just submit them so that if you have specific details for the department so that they're able to act upon those. I'm going to also ask, um, uh, thank the department and the minister for, for being with us today. Um, I know we've run a bit over time, but we do appreciate um, you being here and answering our questions. Um, and as you do know, the committee does regular oversight scheduled and unscheduled. So we will be seeing you um, within the respective schools across the year in the financial year to make sure that what you've said in the book is what is happening on the ground. Um, with that, I will excuse you all now um, to go about your day to day. And I'm just going to ask the committee members just to stay back for the consideration of the vote. Regarding the other committee administration, I'll ask that we just stand that over so that we then deal with all our internal committee administration at once at another time. Uh, HOD, yes? So, no, I just wanted to thank you for that uh, chairperson. I wanted to thank the committee uh, for spirit of engagement. Uh, I know that at the end we all have the learners' interests at heart. That's really what we what we have at heart, and I think we rely on oversight to make sure that we do actually do what it is we say we're going to do. And also, it's an early alert system for us when problems can actually be brought to our attention that perhaps we can't see because clearly, even as a team, we will have blind spots. I have no illusion about that. So I just wanted to thank you for the engagement. I think it was conducted in a good spirit. And uh, yeah, the department sees ourselves as a partner. We were able to actually deliver to uh, quality education for every child in every classroom, in every school inside this province. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. I'm not sure if you wanted um, to, to make any closing remarks. No, just to say thank you very much for the engagement. I think it was very useful and thank you for all the questions. Thank you so much. With that, um, you are excused. Thank there you there will be light lunch served um, between this vote and the next vote, so you're more than welcome to please join Thank us you. and those from the public also to please join us. Right. The committee members are just going to quickly just deliberate on the vote. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Members online, just a reminder to just please stay online for the few minutes just so that we can conclude on the deliberation of the vote. I do thank you for your patience in terms of us running over time. Okay, colleagues, well, I'm going to take hands now. I see member Allen's hand is already up. I'm going to take hands now regarding if you want extra information um, as well as your view on this particular vote. It is vote five, dealing with education. Okay, member Allen, I see your hand went up first, so you can go ahead. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Um, I firstly wanted to um, support your view that we deal with the adoption of the report. Um, I think that is vital. Um, other than that, I don't have any requests for information at this stage um, and will then lower my hand and lower and, and put it up again once we have an indication that we are able to move um, accordingly. Thank you so much. So that is Member Allen um, regarding the adoption of the vote. Member Philander, I see your hand. Same sentiment, um, Chairperson, in relation to the adoption of the report. Are we first dealing now with, with uh, resolutions? You can indicate both. So if you want, you can start with your view on the vote and you can also indicate if you have extra information that you would like to request. No extra information, Chairperson. I do support uh, Member Allen to support the vote, the vote. Thank you so much. Member Said, I see your hand. Chair, no, thank you. I've submitted uh, my request to Asima just about the Groot Kral issue but also two other, if I may, two other resolutions that I want to just propose is the one is um, the, we want a speedy, at least I, I heard the 
the head of department saying that they'll make a public statement on the SIU findings on their reaction to the Premier's department's report. Remember, they're studying the Premier's department's report now. I think we just want to, I think once they go public or even before they go public, to have a session with the department on that. That's just a proposal just to get a briefing from them as to, you know, uh, how they've responded. Maybe after they send out a statement, then we can just get go into more depth. Then the other one is just a meeting I've asked in the time of the previous chair, but I think now that it has been raised again here, yeah, just that meeting with DBE uh, on the issue of the quintiles, right? So, so, so those two, then just on the issue of the report on the vote, just to register the ANC's minority view that we are not in support of the vote. Thanks. Thank you so much, Member Christians. Uh, th thank you, Chairperson. Uh, just, I think we, um, I, I think we should get just a list of those schools. Um, uh, that's considered as no fee schools, um, that list. And then also if we can get a list of the fencing, accelerated fencing, where there's, especially when I asked the Betha school, um, you know, there's burglaries every day. If we can just do that chairperson. And then I think that the coordinator will have the others um, that we've mentioned, but just also to say from our side, we support the vote uh, from the ACDP side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Brankes. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair yes, in, just in terms of the resolution, um, uh, as we visit the schools throughout the, the Western Cape, we see at some of the schools there's developments taking place on the premises of the schools, uh, certain projects like, for example, in the Mitchell's Plain. I, I, I myself, I have raised it with uh, Wasima. I brought it to her attention. And at this particular school in Mitchell's Plain, there is some uh, project taking place and uh, for some reason, the department or any officials uh, in the WCPB has no uh, knowledge of the 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 the, 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 the projects that, that is taking place at these schools. So, um, if we can uh, 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 just uh, um, get some uh, uh, information of these projects that is taking place in certain schools, like for example, the one I mentioned now in just plain. Uh, so we, we can just get some information and clarity that uh, who is initiating it and uh, is it initiated by the SGBs at the schools or or the school self or or whoever, what do you call it? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Okay, um, I know there's a lot of schools in Mitchell's Plain. Can I, can I ask that if you know of a development at a school that you need more clarity on, that you give the information to the procedural officer so that we get the info? Because if we ask about all developments on all of the schools and uh, wasip, wasip. all of them, Thank you, then we might end up with another blue book. Thank you, Chair. Wasim has the information. Wasim has the information. I, I, I just want to add something. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to add something, Chair. Um, uh, you know, I've been visiting a lot of schools. And uh, the the coordinator has furnished us a letter to send to the department. So I, because of COVID, I don't rock up at schools. You know, I, I send it to the department and then what they do, they maybe send the circuit manager to accompany me and those type of things. So just for the committee's information, maybe that is the way to do it. And Mr. Brent all this, he signs the letter. So I've got the letter with me and go, and I do three, four schools a day and they allowed that. So I'm just gonna say, if we wanna go to schools, maybe just take note. You know, sometimes you get resistance, but maybe we must just do it through the department because of COVID. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. I think in the metro, it's a little bit different than in the rural areas. In the rural areas, everyone just knows each other. We pick up the phone and I phone the person the day before to ask, can I can I come through tomorrow? And they, they generally very opposite. Member Syed? Chair, no, just on that, I think to restrict it to the Mitchell's plane, maybe, maybe a bit of a it may be constraining us. We had in January, I think Wasima would know, a meeting with the Department Public Works and WCED around infrastructure development at schools. And I think we had a municipality there. Maybe what we should do, maybe not now in this term, but probably as a midterm, maybe when we return from the June, July, is try to have a follow-up meeting as to what was the progress from there. And that will also give member Brinkes opportunity to talk about Mitchell's plane and uh, member Allen as well. 
is now also in Mitchell's play. Then uh, the second, the, the second one. <laughs> then the, I would also then add member Mackenzie as the mayor, maybe there, you know. No, no. So <laughs> then the second, then the second one is just thought of it now. I just looked at my notes. Given the issues that were raised about the special needs, maybe we haven't yet had some. Maybe we must have at some point a a meeting with the department and with its specific officials who deal just with schools or learners with special needs. Maybe just a briefing session and and, and, and engagement. Uh, okay. Needs, eh? Yes, yes, yes. Colleagues, we must do another one. Thanks. Okay. Colleagues, some of the items I noted that various people asked for was obviously the briefing that we have to do updates on ECDs. Um, I specifically asked that I do think we need to keep a closer eye on infrastructure um, development, especially with the change within the instruction note. And then I think we can put a separate um, topic down for special needs schools. Um, whether we do that all in one day or different days is another story, but we will work with the procedural officer um, on, on that matter. I also just would like to get the annual procurement plan, which I've asked for, and they've indicated they can also do a briefing for us on safe schools and just give us that particular um, number. And I don't think there's anything else but I just wanted to then place on the record that I also support this particular vote. Colleagues, um, we are going to just do the draft report. Oh, you've already edited. Okay, perfect. So it's a print shoot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Our procedural officers open. Okay, let's share it. Okay, let's share it. Okay, colleagues, let me just read then out to what Miss. Um, Hassan Musa is putting up online. Okay. Report of the Standing Committee on Education on Vote 5, Education in the Schedule to the Western Cape Appropriation Bill, B2 2022, 2022 dated 17 March 2022, as follows. The Standing Committee on Education, having deliberated on the subject of Vote 5, Education in the Schedule to the Western Cape Appropriations Bill, B2 2022, referred to the committee in accordance with Standing Rule 188, reports that it supports the vote. In accordance with Standing Rule 90, the African National Congress expressed its minority view to not support the vote. I just want to put on record, Member um, Brunkes, the reason we didn't include yours is not because we don't want to, it's just we including in the vote the respecting voting members on the report. Okay. <laughs> now I just wanted to make sure that you don't think that I'm... Okay, colleagues? Colleagues, and I just have an indication if everyone is um, in happy with the report, if I could get a mover for the report. Move to adopt, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Philander. If I could get a seconder for the report. I'll second, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member Christians. With that, the report is adopted. And thank you so much for your patience, members, as well as um, your engagement here today. For those in person, please do join us for light lunch after this. Thank you so much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair.